So the agenda, uh, we're going to do uh, introduction overview, talk about what is value investing, uh, some of the key concepts of value investing, uh, and then uh, talk a couple of case studies, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, um, Google and Facebook, um, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So let me uh, first just introduce uh, myself and tell you a little bit about case learning. Um, uh, so uh, I, um, I grew up all around the world. My parents met and married in the Peace Corps, um, went to Harvard undergrad, helped Wendy Kopp start Teach for America, the only job I've ever had in my 30 plus years since college. Um, uh, I worked at Boston Consulting Group for a couple years and then um, uh, went to Harvard Business School, uh, spent five years working with Michael Porter uh, after HBS, uh, starting uh, something called the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, and um, then uh, hung out my shingle as the world's smallest hedge fund on January 1st of 99, almost 20 years ago. I uh, did that for 18 and three quarter years until I uh, closed it up last fall and uh, launched Case Learning. So. Uh, that's a quick, um, quick introduction. Uh, Glenn, you want to come over here and uh, introduce yourself? Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, just as before I introduce myself, as far as the um, process is going, Whitney described that you can uh, ask some questions. Um, if you goof around a little bit on the, um, the application, I think you'll find where to find the chat. And when you find the chat, just put your questions in there and um, I'll be uh, doing my best to answer those questions. So um, I grew up in New Jersey, West Orange, New Jersey, went to Princeton as an undergraduate, studied electrical engineering and computer science there, um, got a, uh, an MBA at, uh, at Wharton in uh, finance and in marketing. Um, my dad started a company called Blondertongue Labs, which was an equipment manufacturer of pay television uh, gear. Uh, and I worked there from, my, from the time I was 10 years old. Um, after he sold the company, I went to work in investment banking. Uh, I was a managing director at DLJ, Donaldson, Lufkin, Jen Red. Uh, after uh, about 20 years at uh, investment banking, I became the president of DLJ Direct, which was an online brokerage firm, a uh, subsidiary of, of DLJ. We went public. I was the president of that um, through the time that DLJ got sold to uh, Credit Suisse First Boston. Um, I went over to work in banking um, at UBS for a couple more years. But while I was at DLJ Direct, um, I got to know Whitney very well. We became uh, friends. We became co-investors in uh, many situations. Um, and I had the investing bug uh, um, and it wasn't going away. Um, and so I, I left investment banking to, uh, to become a hedge fund manager, partners with Whitney um, for eight years uh, on my own for a couple of years after that. Um, and uh, Whitney and I uh, got together uh, about a year ago uh, to um, start with this uh, program that you're gonna see uh, uh, over the next couple hours. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so in short, we've been doing this a long time, uh, both, uh, you know, cumulatively between the two of us, uh, running uh, hedge funds and mutual funds for 30 years combined, uh, been in the world of finance for 50 years combined. Um, so uh, we love uh, we love the business, uh, love the investing game and love to teach it. Uh, so so that's what we're doing now. Um, and it's uh, fun being back together. So. Um, I'm going to really quickly skim through just a couple, uh, a few slides describing case learning. I'll send it around um, the PDF later, um, and then we'll dive right into what you came for, the um, intro to uh, value investing. So um, uh, uh, last fall, after I closed my fund, um, uh, I decided uh, that I love to teach, have a lot to teach the next generation of investors. So created case learning. Uh, Glenn joined me shortly thereafter. Um, and the idea is, is we're trying to teach both with this intro seminar, um, as well as uh, the more advanced uh, courses that, that we teach, uh, what we call lessons from the trenches. Uh, investing is a hard, hard business. Um, and, um, uh, and, and what we're trying to teach is, is, is everything that we've learned, both the things we did right, as well as the things we, uh, we did wrong over the years. Uh, to, to people who are, uh, who are trying to learn. Um, this is a, an experience-based business, um, and it's very, very difficult to get experience other than going around and making mistakes on your own. And so uh, we're, uh, if you're lucky enough to get a job at one of the big shops and someone trains you, that's great, but 99% of investors aren't that lucky. Uh, I wasn't that lucky. Uh, I learned the investing business entirely on my own. Um, and from sitting in on Joel Greenblatt's class at Columbia and going to 21 consecutive Berkshire meetings, um, and so I've, uh, you know, Glenn and I both recognize that there's a real need out there um, for people who, who want to learn from somebody else's experience rather than getting their own experience the hard way. So 
Uh, we teach all case studies. Everything we teach basically is case study oriented, and that's why we've included a couple of case studies to try and bring value investing to life, looking at a couple of very different kinds of stocks um, from Berkshire Hathaway to Google and Facebook. Um, so, uh, you know, we believe that uh, studying mistakes is as important as studying success. Uh, so um, we're, um, we're, we're happy to talk about that and uh, have a lot of case studies in the, in the courses that we teach. Uh, relating to value traps we got caught up in, for example. So, um, you know, we are value investors, but uh, we're so so we don't hold ourselves out for anyone to get rich quick. Uh, we're not going to give you any hot stock tips. Uh, the idea is, is we're trying to teach everyone to be better fishermen, not not give people uh, fish, though we always uh, have some good stock ideas, I think, and uh, we'll teach a couple of them today. Uh, so we also teach the entrepreneurial side of this business. Uh, just being a good investor isn't necessarily enough. Um, a lot of people want to start their own business um, in, in the same way that if you're a great cook, it doesn't necessarily mean you should go out and start your own restaurant. Uh, if you're a great investor and love investing, it doesn't mean you should go out and start your own fund. Uh, but uh, for those who do uh, want to do that or who are already in the process of doing that, uh, we teach that as well. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Again, I'll circulate information via PDF, but we teach a three-day investing boot camp, a one-day seminar on how to launch and build an investment fund, and a one-day what we call an advanced seminar on short selling for people who are interested in that aspect of investing. Uh, so it, it's, it's three programs. We teach over five consecutive days. So that's, uh, for example, we're teaching it this week starting tomorrow. Um, and uh, we're going around the world, uh, what we're calling uh, uh, the Case Learning World Tour starting in London next month, and we're going to hit 13 cities in the next nine months, uh, as well as teaching it a couple more times in New York, doing our short selling conference on September 24th for the second time. So uh, we have a very, very full agenda and are looking forward to uh, uh, you know, going around the world and uh, teaching this outside of New York. Uh, this week is the fourth time we've taught our programs here in New York since last December. Uh, so uh, let's uh, just dive into uh, an overview of value investing. So uh, what is value investing? The concept is super simple. It's, 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 it's easy in concept, uh, difficult in practice. Uh, so all value investing is, is trying to buy a stock or other financial asset for less than it's worth. Um, so that may sound sort of obvious, but I would argue the vast, vast, vast majority of the money in this world is, um, is what I would call greater fool investing, buying something in the hopes that somebody else will come along and buy it for you at a higher price. Um, uh, Bitcoin would be a classic example of that. So um, I also want to contrast the value investing. Uh, everyone says, oh, well, there's value investing and growth investing. Um, and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, all intelligent investing is value investing. Growth is merely a component of value and calculating value is, is looking at what the growth of cash flows would be in the future. So um, I want to emphasize that value investing is not what uh, many think, which is buying lousy businesses that are fading away into oblivion at some statistically cheap multiple of earnings or sales or cash flow or something like that. Um, uh, that's sort of a false impression about value investing. So uh, the key precepts of value investing uh, start with intrinsic value, which is the true value of a company or an asset based on all aspects of the business, both tangible and intangible. So typically, uh, the intrinsic value of something is calculated or estimated by projecting future cash flows and then discounting them back to the present. Um, again, simple in concept, uh, the math is easy, the inputs are what's hard, predicting the future is what's hard. Um, so keep in mind, intrinsic value is never a precise number. If somebody tells you, you know, I've calculated the value of this company and it's $1.35 billion or $10.23 a share, um, that doesn't make any sense. A sensible statement would be, I think uh, I estimate intrinsic value is somewhere between one and $1.4 billion, a range of 10 to $14 a share. The stock today is at six. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, I think it's trading well below intrinsic value. That would be a sensible statement. So keep in mind, intrinsic value is not the same as the current market value. The whole point of value investing is to identify discrepancies between intrinsic value and uh, the current market value. Generally speaking, what value investors are trying to do is, is find the very rare situations, especially nine years into a bull market, when there's a huge gap between intrinsic value and, and the current market value. Uh, so, um, 
my clicker has failed me here, so let me do it. Um, so second, uh, another key concept uh, of value investing is margin of safety. The classic book on value investing, if you're gonna start anywhere, uh, would be The Intelligent Investor, the classic book written the better part of a century ago by Benjamin Graham. Um, and Warren Buffett was a student of his way back when. Um, in chapter 20, uh, the quote, the two key quotes is, is the margin of safety is always dependent on the price paid. It will be large at one price, small at some higher price, non-existent at some still higher price. Um, the key concept here is, is that the margin of safety is available for absorbing the effect of miscalculations or worse than average luck. So the, uh, the concept here is very simple. If you're building a bridge, and you're gonna have 10 uh, two-ton trucks going over it. So that's 20 tons. You don't build a bridge uh, that can hold 22 tons uh, worth of weight. You wanna build a bridge that holds 50 or 100 tons, right? Um, so, so that's the concept behind uh, um, uh, margin of safety. Um, so the other key concept is chapter eight. So if you're gonna start with the intelligent investor, start with chapter eight and chapter 20. Uh, chapter eight says uh, is that the market, uh, you should not look to the market for signals as to what you should do. You must be, you must have the market be your servant, not your guide. So the key quote here is uh, from Benjamin Graham is the investor with a portfolio of sound stock should expect their prices to fluctuate and should neither be concerned by sizable declines nor become excited by sizable advances. He should always remember that market quotations are there for his convenience, either to be taken advantage of or to be ignored. Those words could have been written yesterday. They were written almost a century ago by Ben Graham. Um, and he uh, tells the parable of Mr. Market, where there's a, there's a very emotional fellow and you and he uh, own a business. Um, and every day he comes and offers you a price at which he's willing to sell you his share of the business. And some days he loves the business, very excited by it and offers you a high price. Um, and obviously you should not buy it then. And in fact, at a high enough price, you might offer to sell him your share of the business at that price, right? Um, and, but other times he becomes, uh, he's a very emotional fellow. So he becomes depressed and offers to sell you his share at a very, very uh, low price, well below your calculation of intrinsic value. And at that point you should buy it from him. So, um, it's, it's the viewing the stock market just as if uh, you, you were dealing with this emotional fellow, Mr. Market, is the sensible way to, to think about it. So um, how do you beat the market? There, uh, it's, it's sort of a tautology to say that there are three possible ways you can try and beat the market. Number one is, is you can be a good stock picker and pick better stocks than average. Number two is you can be a good market timer and you can, you can cleverly get out of the market at high uh, market high points and get back in at market low points. Or number three is, is you can uh, use leverage. So if the market's up 10% and you're levered two to one uh, and you just own the market, you're gonna be up 20%, right? Um, use debt. Um, and you know historically, Glenn and I have always focused on number one. Um, uh, trying to be a stock market timer, we found uh, some people are good at it. We don't. We haven't been very good at it. That's not where we think we have an edge. Um, and as as far as leverage goes, um, taking on debt uh, is is great when things are going well, um, but it will put you out of business uh, when things aren't. So we tend to avoid uh, leverage either in the form of straight borrowings or using options. So. What we focus on is, uh, is uh, good stock picking, and that's what I'd recommend for the vast, vast, vast majority of people who are out there trying to beat the market. And by the way, there's no shame in saying, you know what, I got better things to do with my time. I'm just gonna buy an index fund um, and, um, and, uh, or maybe try and find a talented manager or two. But uh, for, for most people, including my, my parents, uh, had uh, most of their money in index funds, even when I was running uh, some of their money uh, in my hedge fund for 18 years. So uh, there's no shame in indexing and, um, and, and spending uh, your time and brain power uh, uh, elsewhere. But I assume you're on this call because you're interested in investing and maybe trying to beat the market either professionally or just in your personal account. So uh, let's talk about uh, some of the ways to do that. So. Um, one of the key concepts uh, of if you're going to try and uh, be a good stock picker is, is for every stock that you own, ask yourself, the, uh, ask yourself, what's your variant perception? In other words, a stock's price reflects the consensus view out there in the marketplace, what the, the consensus view of analysts and investors is. So the, uh, the idea behind variant perception 
uh, a term I first learned in a, in a book by Michael Steinhardt, um, one of the great early hedge fund managers, is, is if, if anytime you're buying a stock, you must have a variant perception. You must believe something different than what is the general consensus view. So if you're buying it, you obviously think the company's future is brighter than the, the consensus view, that the company will, will do better than what people are expecting, and therefore the stock is likely to go up. Keep in mind, built into every stock price is a certain set of expectations. Anytime you're buying a stock, by definition, your expectations are higher or better than the consensus view. And so you need to be very clear about, well, exactly what is it that you think that is, that is different than the market? That's your variant perception. And uh, to, to, to do well, you only have to do two things. Number one, you have to have a variant perception, but then secondly, you have to be right. And that's the hard part. I could have a variant perception on every stock in the marketplace. The key, though, is, is the, the market as a whole and the herd, the, the collective, all the millions of investors in the world um, are, are generally pretty wise uh, and being humble in, in understanding the crowd is usually right. And that what you're looking for is, is the occasional needle in the haystack, um, the occasional stock. Uh, where the market's just got it wrong and you're absolutely convinced of it, you know what your variant perception is, um, and then you uh, place your bet accordingly, you invest accordingly. So um, when you're looking at, at a stock, uh, I, I just boil it down to a four-step process. Um, so the first steps are evaluating. Um, so the first question I always ask when I open up the newspaper, when I look at a website, when a friend tells me about a stock, uh, when I encounter a company, however I encounter it, the first step I always ask is this circle of competence. Uh, do I understand this company in this industry? Um, and if I don't have a lot of expertise, do I think I can build that expertise? Um, and then can I make reasonable projections about the company's future? Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, circle of competence is one of those critical concepts um, where um, it's obviously the more ponds that you can fish in, uh, the more likely you are to find something great. But you, you don't need to have a huge circle of competence. In fact, I know people who have built entire careers doing nothing but, for example, investing in biotech stocks or investing in small cap banking stocks. Uh, so um, it's far more important than, than the size of your circle of competence is, is knowing its boundaries and being humble about its boundaries and not getting sucked in to you know, some uh, hot stock pitch about some emerging biotech company or some bank in Kazakhstan that sounds really cheap or something like that where you're, it's way outside your circle of competence. Uh, where investors get into trouble is, uh, is when they uh, lose that humility and start straying outside their circle of competence. And, and uh, when I look back on my investing career and the stocks I, I invested in that didn't work, where I got my head handed to me, um, it was very often started at step one, um, where I was outside my circle of competence, but I thought I wasn't. So number two, um, once I determine that something's within my circle of competence, uh, I look at a company and industry evaluation. Um, and here, it's not really rocket science. I'm just sort of asking, is this a good business? Does it have sustainable competitive advantages? Uh, high returns on capital? What's, uh, is there good growth prospects? Um, does it have a decent balance sheet? Is it generating a lot of cash flow? So I'm, I'm doing a company level analysis and then I'm also doing an industry level analysis. Uh, are the trends in the industry favorable? Is there, are there tailwinds here or are there headwinds? What are the industry dynamics like? Uh, sort of a Porter Five Forces analysis. Um, if I can, I'm looking for some sort of informational edge. Uh, if I know people in the industry, uh, maybe I go visit a lot of stores. Um, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to get an edge just talking to management because everybody talks to management. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I've been able to, I don't know, read some body language um, um, and, you know, maybe gain an understanding of the culture of a company by getting to know management. And sometimes that can be a real edge. Um, so I'm looking for an edge here, but fundamentally, um, I'm just trying to answer the question, is this a good company? Is this a good industry? And by the way, uh, I'll invest in lousy companies in lousy industries at the right price, but boy, it had better be the right price if, uh, if I don't think there's, uh, if I don't think the company's earnings are going to be higher. Um, you know, if it's one of my friends, uh, uh who spoke at our, our seminar, uh, last month, 
He said, I'm not a value investor. I'm a make money investor. All I'm doing is trying to find companies that are earning a dollar a share today and they're going to earn $5 a share at some point in the future. It almost doesn't matter when, but let's just say five years out. And all I'm looking for on the short side is companies that are making $5 a share currently and their earnings are going down to a dollar a share. And he said, it almost doesn't matter the valuation uh, on the way up. If earnings go from a dollar to $5, it almost doesn't matter what, what multiple you're paying of earnings today. And of course it does. But uh, there are very, very, very few companies where earnings go up 5x and the stock isn't going up to at least some degree, right? Um, and same thing uh, is true on the inverse side. So um, thirdly, once I've evaluated the company in the industry, then I evaluate management. Um, and I'm asking three questions. Are they good operators? Are they good capital allocators? And are they trustworthy and shareholder friendly? Um, and uh, keep in mind, most people become CEOs because they operate the business well. They're good managers. Um, but uh, most CEOs uh, um, rule, rule their boards. Uh, so the boards are sort of part and parcel of the CEO. And uh, often as much value is created uh, over time based on capital allocation. Um, how many companies have been brought to ruin by a big dumb acquisition where they overpaid, took on a lot of debt, and uh, bought a pig and a poke, right? Um, how much value has been destroyed and right to this very day is being destroyed by companies buying back uh, large amounts of share with their free cash flow um, when, uh, when their shares are trading at all time highs and are probably way overvalued, right? And of course, uh, when the business turns and the shares uh, crash, all of a sudden they stop buying back shares at $10 a share when they were buying back, uh, buying them back enthusiastically at $50 a share, right? So those kind of capital allocation decisions are really important. Um, uh, so you got to look. You got to look at all three pieces here, all three questions. So let's just say now we've got all three steps to evaluating stocks. I've found uh, a company that has uh, that's well within my circle of competence. I like the business. I like the industry, um, and uh, I like the managers. So why don't I run out and buy it? And the answer is, is I could find hundreds of companies today that have all of those characteristics. The last part here, though, is key, which is valuation. We're value investors. That, again, doesn't mean just buying low multiple crummy declining companies. Um, as we're going to argue, it can involve buying something like Google or Facebook, probably the two greatest businesses in the history of the world. Um, and so the key, though, is, is, is uh, valuation. And you want to be saying to yourself, uh, is this stock really, really cheap? And uh, one of my friends two decades ago put it well. He said, you know, I like to buy things when I'm trembling with greed. That's just a good concept to keep in mind. Are you trembling with greed when you're buying this, this stock? Um, in other words, is there a huge margin of safety? If you've calculated, conservatively calculated that a stock uh, is worth 20 to $25 a share, don't buy it at 19, buy it at 10. That's trembling with greed cheap. Now the dilemma of course is, is here we are almost a decade into a long complacent bull market where stocks have uh, quadrupled off their lows um, in March of 2009. And there aren't very many trembling with green stocks out there. Um, I'll be honest. Uh, and so some investors are sitting on a lot of cash. Uh, some investors are straying over to, you know, buying things and, you know, there are cheaper, cheaper looking stocks, you know, in uh, Kazakhstan, for example, than here in the U.S. market. Um, and uh, other people are sort of, um, you know, they're not trembling with greed, but they're buying 80 or 90 cent dollars, you know, things that, that aren't as cheap. Um, but they're still moderately undervalued and, you know, waiting for, um, you know, sort of playing defense. And that's sort of what I did for nine years. And frankly, it didn't work. Um, we have been in a market now for almost a decade where if you absolutely suspended all valuation principles, and in fact, the more risk you took, um, the more you've been rewarded. The people who are speculating in Bitcoin five or 10 years ago have made an absolute fortune. The value investors who are sort of playing defense, holding some cash, had a short book, et cetera, have badly trailed this bull market. And it's one of the things that put me out of business. So this, uh, you know, this uh, valuation piece is a tough one. It's, it's especially tough in this kind of market. So let me just talk about valuation. Like how do you value companies, right? Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, the first and most important way is just a discounted cash flow. The, the future, uh, take, estimate the future free cash flows a company is going to produce from now until eternity discount it back to the present and you know people always say oh what discount rate should you use 
I don't know, use eight or 10%, maybe 12%. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is the discount rate isn't what matters. What matters is, is whether you're roughly correct that a company's cash flows are going to go up a lot in the next five or 10 years. Uh, uh, if that's the case, uh, you know, in a, in a handful of cases, that's reflected in the stock price. And even if that happens, you don't want to uh, own that stock. Uh, but, but in most cases, if you're right about the company and about its future cash flows, you're going to be right on the stock. Uh, so that's where you should focus your attention, discounted cash flows. Um, there are a lot of other ways, though. Uh, looking at public company comps, if uh, if you're looking at a stock that's trading at 10 times earnings and every other company in the sector is trading at 15 times earnings, that might be an indication. It's probably because this particular company is underperforming and probably justifiably trades at a discount. But you know, different companies in different industries um, you know, go in and out of favor. I remember times you know, in the fast food burger sector, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, um, uh, CKE restaurants, uh, um, and uh, Wendy's, have over the t over the last 20 years that I've been following all of those companies at different times, uh, every one of those companies has been a high flyer and traded at the highest multiple in the sector and the lowest multiple and the inverse. Uh, so uh, so you know, but so public company comps can be an indicator of uh, of cheapness. Um, another thing to look at is is if 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 there's a lot of uh, M and A activity in the sector, if bigger companies are buying smaller companies, looking at what those acquisition comps look like, what multiple of earnings, EBITDA, uh, revenues are companies being acquired for, um, that could be an indication that the company you're looking at is cheap. Uh, so historical comps, if a, comp if a stock has traded at uh, 15 to 20 times earnings for the last 20 years, um, they missed a quarter or two, and the stock's trading at 10 times earnings, um, go take a hard look. That's like a classic value investment. Um, something, I, uh, the classic, classic, classic value investment is a good company that's encountered uh, problems and has missed earnings um, and has guided down uh, missed expectations and the stock has been punished in two ways. Number one, earnings may have gone down. And number two, the multiple that investors place on those earnings has gone down. So it's a double whammy to the downside. Um, uh, looking, uh, so the key though is, is are the problems that the company is experiencing fixable? Are they cyclical problems and are earnings going to rebound? Or is this, is there been a permanent shift? Is the permanent business permanently impaired? Is this a newspaper company or a paging company or something that's in permanent decline? In which case, uh, you're probably looking at a value trap. You do not want to invest. So the key is, is finding stocks where other people think they are in a secular or permanent decline and you uh, correctly anticipate that the problems are fixable and maybe there's a new CEO who's come in, new strategy, new plan, uh, you know, whatever's causing the short-term problems uh, go away. And now a year later, the comps, uh, the year-over-year -year revenue and earnings growth is great. Um, and now earnings have rebounded and the multiple investors place on those earnings has gone back up. And then you get a double, uh, those two things combined to give you a double benefit to the upside. Uh, so looking at historical comps can give you a clue about that. Um, another way to do valuation is, is look at the sum of the parts. If a company, um, one of the classic uh, investments here was when uh, 10, 10 or so years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, Bill Ackman identified that Wendy's owned a real gem called Tim Hortons, which is sort of like the Dunkin' Donuts of Canada. Um, and, and he uh, saw that the value of Tim Hortons, if it were a separate standalone business, was worth the entire market cap of Wendy's. And the market was only valuing the Wendy's burger business and the franchising and restaurant business and was assigning no value to Tim Hortons. So he went in, bought a bunch of stock, hired Blackstone to do an analysis and pushed the company to spin off Tim Hortons. Sure enough, they did. Tim Hortons traded up to uh, the, the high valuation that it deserved in the stock the two pieces ended up being worth double. Um, so that's where that's the kind of example where, where not only was the sum of the parts analysis correct, but there was a catalyst to unlock that. Be careful though of, of just adding up all the pieces of the business. Like it would be incorrect in my view to use the sum of the parts analysis to justify buying Berkshire Hathaway today. There are good reasons to own Berkshire, which Glenn's gonna talk about in a little bit, but one of them is not a sum of the parts analysis because Berkshire I don't think is ever gonna be broken up even when the reins pass to Buffett's successor. Um, so doing that kind of analysis uh, just isn't very useful. 
Um, and lastly, um, there are some rules of thumb about valuation and got to be very careful here because I've gotten into trouble using sort of old style value rules of thumb, like don't pay more than 10 times earnings for normalized earnings for a decent business, never pay more than 15 or 20 times earnings for a great business. And as a result of those misapplied rules of thumb, in my case, um, I missed out on some, uh, you know, some of the greatest stocks of all time because I was just sort of focused on these uh, classic old rules of thumb that uh, for certain companies uh, didn't apply and shouldn't have applied. So let's just talk briefly about value traps because one of the biggest dangers to value investors is getting caught up in a value trap, a, a, a stock that looks cheap when you buy it and then just stays cheap. Um, and the business deteriorates, the earnings deteriorate, the multiple stay is low, the earnings get cut in half. And here mathematically, if you buy a stock that looks cheap at let's say eight times earnings, um, and the earnings get cut in half, and it still trades at eight times earnings, well, guess what? Mathematically, the stock's gotten cut in half as well, right? That's a value trap. Um, so, you know, some of the value traps we've been caught up in over time is uh, 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 JDate, the, uh, a company called Spark Networks, which owns JDate, the Jewish uh, dating website, um, and uh, uh, a free service, Tinder, came along and materially impaired that business. Um, another company called Magic Jack, remember those late night TV commercials for the internet, uh, uh, change your phone service at home uh, to using the internet and cut your phone bill? Well, that was great until uh, phone is now thrown in as part of a triple package with cable TV and high speed internet, for example. So now you're competing against free there as well. Um, secularly declining industries, how many people have gotten trapped in something like Bed Bath & Beyond where it's just gone it's gone down and down and down and down as the business has gotten clobbered by Amazon and other online competitors um, and the stocks look cheap all the way down. Paging companies, check printers, newspapers, um, so all classic value traps. Um, uh, other value investors get caught up because they fall in love with the story or the CEO and they, fall, and they ignore the numbers. Uh, Valiant, uh, Platform Holdings, Enron, Visible Genetics was a little company I fell in love with years ago and lost virtually all my money. Um, obviously, anytime there's fraud, um, you're going to get killed uh, and those can be value traps. Um, and lastly, value traps, sometimes the stock just doesn't go anywhere for a while. Does, you know, it doesn't go down. Uh, it just takes a while for the story to play out, for the business to turn around. And meanwhile, the stock doesn't go anywhere. Well, that's okay if you're, if you're patient and you're eventually proven right. The problem is, is uh, if you own options and you sort of get greedy and now options are decaying, um, time is working against you. Um, and so how many times have I seen uh, myself, not that often, fortunately, but I've seen a lot of other people be right on a stock, but they're impatient and they're greedy, and they buy options, and they turn a perfectly good stock into a value trap because they manifested the position through options. So uh, just want to talk briefly about the concept of focus investing. If you're going to try and beat the market, you can't own the market. You can't own 100 plus stocks, which is what most mutual funds are trying to do. Um, you know, generally speaking, my advice to people and the way I ran my fund is, is you should own somewhere between at least 10 stocks probably, um, and no individual position, probably that much bigger than 10%, uh, maybe 15%. Um, but, uh, uh, but you don't want to own uh, probably more than 20 stocks. So somewhere between 10 and 20. Everyone's got to be comfortable with their own number. And maybe once in a while making a big bet on something super cheap and super safe like I did with Berkshire Hathaway early in my career and put 30% of my $4 million fund 15 months into my investing career in March of 2000 at the very peak of the internet bubble, I put 30% of my fund into Berkshire Hathaway. It turned out to be the, literally the day it bottomed, um, back at the peak, uh, literally the day the NASDAQ peaked was the day Berkshire bottomed, and that's the day I put 30% of my little fund into it. I don't recommend doing that very often though, and I've never done it since in 20 years, uh, but that was a unique situation. Um, generally speaking, you want to run a concentrated yet diversified, if, if, if uh, uh, sorry if that's a little bit of a brain twister uh, portfolio. Uh, so uh, that's the concept of focus investing. So um, I'm going to quickly run through this because uh, um, uh, I'd love to get to a couple case studies and have Glenn uh, teach some Berkshire in a little bit. But uh, um, and, and like I said, there's a lot of text on here, um, and I'll send you guys the PDF. But 
there, you know, there's different ways that you can try and get an edge. And you should be thinking about these if you're going to be out there in the market, because if you can't answer what your edge is or how you think you have an edge over uh, all the other smart people out there in the market and all the supercomputers out there that are getting increasingly smart, um, then you're in trouble if you, if you can't articulate and execute on at least some of these things. So number one, just being small and being able to poke around the nooks and crannies of the market um, is, is, uh, is a big edge. Warren Buffett has said that he could compound at 50% a year with a million dollars under management, but then he added, I couldn't do it with, uh, with 10 million under management. Uh, so, so size can be an edge. Number two, time arbitrage. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of the money in the world is on a hair trigger. They're looking to make money quick. They're trying to bet on a company beating its quarterly earnings numbers next week um, and trying to make a quick 10 or 20%. Um, so if you can take the opposite and extend your time horizon and say, you know what, there is no near-term catalyst. I don't have a view um, on this quarter's earnings. In fact, I fully anticipate that the, uh, the problems that are currently plaguing the business are likely to persist for a while. And I'm not exactly sure when they're going to uh, fade and when earnings are going to rebound. But I think it's going to happen sometime in the next year, but maybe it'll take two years. And meanwhile, I'm buying the stock cheap enough today and I can be patient. My average holding period is three to five years. Uh, so, so, you know, having that kind of approach. And I think increasingly in this increasingly index fund and quantitative fund driven environment, extending your time horizon, having, having lower portfolio turnover um, is a big advantage. So third is concentration. The vast majority of money in the world is wildly over diversified. Uh, most mutual funds hold well over 100 stocks. All the big pools of money in the world, basically, with the exception of Berkshire Hathaway, um, are, are wildly over diversified. And if you can instead focus on your 10 or 12 best ideas and every once in a while make it make an even bigger than 10% bet, um, that's, a way to, that's a way to have an edge. So number four, you can have an analytical edge and just be smarter than everybody else. Um, some people can do that. That's a hard way to get, get have an edge these days. And, and you know, a lot of people think they have an analytical edge and they don't. Um, classic uh, overconfidence. Uh, number five, informational edge. Um, again, that's, this is hard uh, because there are all sorts of laws, especially in the United States. But look, if you're investing in India um, or China, um, there, it's more of the Wild West out there, and, uh, and if you're very clever, um, you can get an informational edge. Also, if you specialize, um, you know, uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, Berna Barsha, who's starting up a fund, uh, Viola Capital, this year, um, in the next couple months, she has spent 20 years uh, post-Harvard Business School, um, almost exclusively investing in the consumer space, consumer and retail companies. She knows that space cold. She knows uh, a lot of people in the industry. She's just incredibly plugged in in that industry. And I think that gives her an informational edge. Um, so that's something you want to cultivate. Um, number six, experience. This is an experience-based business. Um, and over time, being on a very steep learning curve, getting up that experience curve, um, uh, and you can have an experience-based edge. Um, number seven, an emotional edge. Um, uh, we teach a, a, a multi-hour module on behavioral finance or investor irrationality. Investors are hardwired. In fact, all human beings, with almost without exception, are hardwired to be uh, very emotional and irrational when it comes to all financial decisions, including investing. Um, and so understanding that and controlling your own emotions uh, is key. Um, uh, lastly, relationships. Uh, and this can uh, relates to maybe informational and experience as well. But just uh, developing a network of smart investors to share ideas with, getting to know certain CEOs, um, uh, you know, having those kind of relationships uh, can give you an edge over time. So, uh, Glenn, why don't you come and uh, walk us through Berkshire Hathaway? There, just click the top right there to, to advance it. Terrific. Uh, thanks, Whitney. And um, we're getting a, a lot of great questions. Many of them are not lending themselves to very quick answers, so we'll, we'll address those uh, in the, uh, the question and, and answer period. Um, interestingly, a couple of questions about Berkshire Hathaway um, have, uh, have popped up. So um, Whitney and, uh, and I, uh, when we were running money together, um, 
have done had, have done quite well with uh, investing in Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, we've owned it for, for the longest of times, but it's varied in size. And uh, understanding a company like Berkshire um, and knowing when to buy it and when to scale it up, when to scale back is very, very valuable. And frankly, it was very good for our business to have very specific um, expertise uh, in, in, in Berkshire. So it's great to, to find a company like this and to actually um, uh, you know, become the local expert on it. So what, what is Berkshire today? It's a, the stock uh, trades at $301,000 per share, 1.64 million shares outstanding. The stock's never split. So the market cap is about half a trillion dollars. Total assets of the business, um, uh, equity, revenue, and float are listed here on this, uh, uh, this fourth line. A book value per share of $211,000, so uh, stocks trading in about um, 1.5 times book. There's a repurchase option that uh, Buffett has described that he's gonna, he would buy in the stock at 1.2 times book. So that's effectively a floor if you think about when you um, are buying into Berkshire Hathaway. It's effectively where he would be buying it. So it's unlikely that the stock would drip, uh, drop dramatically below that. The downside to that put is approximately 16%. So the price is booked right now 1.43 times. Berkshire Hathaway is the ninth largest company in the world and third largest in the US by revenues. That's really astounding. Uh, this company has compounded uh, amazingly uh, through the last 50, I believe, two years where uh, Buffett was is the, been the core steward. So today, uh, Berkshire is a network of uh, wholly owned companies, those are the pretty pictures, and equity investments, uh, shares of what he would call wonderful uh, investments. You can see the largest position, um, $44 billion, uh, has been invested in Apple Computer. Uh, that's very interesting since it was zero uh, two years ago. Uh, so he's not afraid to uh, find a, uh, uh, one of those punches on the punch card that Whitney talked about and, uh, and scale it up heavily. Uh, the owned businesses are things from railroads to insurance to uh, retailing businesses, and we'll talk about those. So Berkshire is really two different types of businesses. One is wholly owned businesses, and one is small, uh, well, medium-sized slugs of very large businesses, uh, public equities. Um, Berkshire's non-investment income has soared over time. Okay, so, so this, is, this is really important. In the early days, uh, Berkshire Hathaway could take equity stakes in companies. They, they're an insurance company, and they take the money that uh, clients of the insurance company give them, and in, they were investing it in equity securities, and um, Buffett was a great stock picker. So that was what drove uh, Berkshire Hathaway value over time, is the equity portfolio. Over time, what has happened is Berkshire's gone so big that it is very, very difficult for him to be as nimble in investing. And in fact, he's bought full companies. And that's sort of what this green line uh, represents. This green line is the non-investment income, the earnings of the wholly owned companies of Berkshire Hathaway. So the green line is the businesses that they own. The blue line is their investment income on fixed income securities. So that's uh, what's not invested in, um, uh, in wholly owned companies. Uh, there's uh, income on fixed income and there's dividends from uh, equity securities. And the red line is the uh, uh, operating profit of the insurance businesses. And over this chart, which I guess is 15 years, you can see that the insurance businesses have, have, have actually generated money over time. That's remarkable. So people give Berkshire Hathaway money for the insurance policies. Berkshire earns money on the insurance policies that they write and they invest the capital to generate the blue line and the green line. Uh, so earnings and investments per share have risen steadily over time. So this chart just basically shows what the pre-tax EPS of Berkshire Hathaway has been over time, the red line, and the investments per share uh, of Berkshire Hathaway, which is the blue line. So if you think about valuing Berkshire, what we talked about is it owns assets, that would be fixed income investments, small uh, positions in stocks like uh, Apple and Coca-Cola, um, American Express, and operating businesses like the railroads, like the retailing businesses. So the way we, we, we um, value Berkshire is the same way you'd value any other business. You look at what the earnings per share are and you put a multiple on it. And then you look at the assets on top of that and you add those linearly to the, uh, the um, uh, 
the capitalized version of the earnings. So for example, in 2017, each share of Berkshire Hathaway had underlying to it cash and investments of $200,000 per share, and their share of the operating businesses was approximately $12,900 per share. You put a multiple on that 12,009, uh, 12, we use 11 times uh, the pre-tax EPS, which is probably conservative given the quality of the businesses that Berkshire owns. And you add the 201 to the 11 times 12 to get an intrinsic value per share of $343. On this busy uh, slide, you can see that we've done that for each of the last uh, approximately 20 years. So what's interesting is if you graph that intrinsic value that we calculate, that's this red stair step, and you compare it to the price chart of Berkshire Hathaway, which is this blue squiggly line, you can see that the intrinsic value and the stock price straddle each other over time. And obviously, when you purchase at a significant discount to intrinsic value, i.e. the blue line is lower than the red um, stair step, that's a great time uh, to purchase the stock. So for example, in 2000, it looks like a little bit of a blip. Um, uh, that's, that's when Whitney said he put uh, the large uh, allocation into his fund. Um, Berkshire was trading at uh, approximately $40,000 a share. I think the intrinsic value back then was around 60. And you can see that it bounced up uh, very quickly. You can also see in this chart the financial uh, crisis where the, uh, the stock drip, uh, dipped down uh, materially below intrinsic value and it popped up quite a bit. And in 2016, um, there was another great, great opportunity. Actually over this chart, there's probably five core periods where it was a great opportunity. Um, so, Whitney, you're a... Uh... I was trying to use my pointer. Okay, well that's good, because I was wondering where the pointer was. It's a little difficult to talk to the slide. Um, we'll do better next time. Okay, so what do, we, what do we expect for Berkshire Hathaway? Current intrinsic value that I walked through is $343,000 per share. Add 6% annual growth to the intrinsic value of the business, um, plus probably $10,000 per share of cash build over the next 12 months equals an intrinsic value in a year of $374,000, 24% above today's price. Um, and remember that there's a put on the downside, but a year from now, the intrinsic value, is go the book value is going to go up. So the upside downside to Berkshire is, is, is pretty favorable today, but it's nowhere near the uh, 35, 40% discounts to intrinsic value that we've seen five times, frankly, since we've uh, um, been, been studying this company. Uh, so the conclusion, it's an extremely safe company uh, at a time where uh, complacency is at an all-time high. Extremely safe sounds pretty good uh, to us. The upside, uh, it's 12% below intrinsic value with 24% uh, upside over the next year. The downside today is 16% um, to the 1.2 times book value. A year from now, that'll be in the single digits uh, downside. So over the next year, the likelihood is 24% up probably eight or 9% down. So it's a, it's a, pretty, um, uh, a pretty good risk reward in today's environment. And as we said, uh, we think intrinsic value is growing at uh, six to 8% annually. Um, we did get a number of questions about Berkshire that we're gonna talk about in the, uh, in the Q and A. Um, as I bring Whitney back up here, I'm gonna give him one of them to, to, to knock it off the Q and A, which is lots of famous value investors have followed Buffett over the years. Sure. Who are the investors today that are going to perform like Buffett has over the next 20 years? Boy, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I must say, I've been humbled in two ways. One is, is you know, I uh, after 12 years, my first 12 years out of the box, starting in January of 99, um, beat the market almost every year, uh, almost tripled my investors' money after fees in a flat market. Um, and, uh, um, and I was sort of riding high. I sort of would have put myself in that group and uh, then falls seven years of underperformance during this long bull market. Um, and it's not just happened to me. We got a couple questions on the chat um, about you know, some other you know, bigger name investors that this has happened to as well. Um, and uh, some of the, so, you know, some of the best, most respected uh, value-oriented managers, um, you know, had very strong, very long, you know, ten-plus year, even twenty-year track records, um, 
and uh, have been humbled in recent years. And I guess um, it does remind me a little bit of the late 90s. There was a 17 year bull market when I first started investing. Um, it was the very tail end of that bull market. And in hindsight, I was a bit of a bull market genius. Uh, every stock I picked went up in 1997, 1998, 1999. And you know that was part of the reason I, I launched my own fund. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, the problem is, is you never can tell, is this time different? Are we in the late stages of another bull market and, uh, the people who are sort of playing defense, who are focused on valuation, uh, who are holding cash, waiting for there to be some turmoil in the markets, who are holding a short book that will pay off if there's turmoil in the markets, you know, is that strategy dead or at least dead for the foreseeable future or might it start to work? Um, so it's, you know, generally speaking, uh, my general advice and what I would do with, you know, my parents' money, for example, their retirement money, and they're, they've still got another 20 plus years, uh, um, the uh, life expectancy. So that's sort of, they have a fairly long-term horizon, um, is having a, you know, a chunk in cash, a good chunk in cash right now, um, um, uh, indexing part of it. Um, and, uh, and then uh, picking, uh, picking some stocks um, and owning some Berkshire Hathaway, for example. Um, so, so, you know, I've picked some stocks for them. I've got them in some index funds and we're sitting on quite a bit of cash. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I do think that uh, value investing isn't dead, that people practicing uh, conservative investing um, and who are preparing for a storm are likely to outperform. I, I, I'm not sure when, I'm not predicting that the market tips over anytime real soon. Uh, but I think having some money with some people who are you know, proven long-term investors who have just been sort of trailing this, uh, this uh, complacent bull market and trailing the index funds, um, you know, having some money uh, invested in that kind of conservative and defensive strategy um, is probably prudent with at least a portion of your portfolio. Um, I hesitate to throw names out there because um, I guess I've been humbled enough in trying to throw names out there in the past. Um, so, I, uh, you know, we're going to give you a couple uh, stock ideas of, of something that uh, some stocks, something like Berkshire Hathaway, which is one of those stocks that has kept up in this long bull market. It is not outperformed, but it's a very defensive stock. Uh, and uh, it's, it generates enormous cash flows, as Glenn just showed, um, and I think will particularly outperform and be a good defensive stock in a down market, but it keeps up in an up market, right? So it's, it's, uh, that's why it's one of our, has been one of our largest positions. Um, but I think also owning uh, some blue chips in the new economy makes sense as well. Uh, and so having a, a portfolio that has uh, maybe some new economy giants, uh, but not too much. The valuations are, are pretty stretched. But I think Google and Facebook um, are, are likely to see earnings go up a lot, and they're not trading at crazy multiples. So let me just run you through some of the math there. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, um, uh, we'll get to uh, some questions, and there are a lot of good questions coming in on the chat uh, that we're looking forward to uh, tackling. So. Um, so here's Google. Um, this is about a month ago. The stock's up about 10% from here. Um, so just adjust it, uh, adjust your math accordingly. Um, uh, but it's one of the largest companies in the world approaching, along with Amazon and uh, Apple, um, is approaching a trillion dollar market cap. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a giant, but uh, the, it's just got an incredible um, virtuous cycle going on where it's large user base, translates into a large advertising base, translates into better monetization, translates into uh, more uh, money that they can invest in R&D. Um, and then, um, you know, they've got a better product, high barriers to entry and lather, rinse, repeat. It's just an incredible virtuous cycle the company has uh, going on. Um, here's what Google's revenue growth looks like um, going back uh, uh, almost uh, two decades. It's just been an, an extraordinary uh, increase. Revenue is up 35x in the last 15 years. Um, now, here's what's interesting. This is not, uh, this is revenue growth. This is per year over year percentage revenue growth. And what, what's amazing here is, is that there was very high percentage growth, you know, back a decade ago or so. And then growth slowed down a lot, but then the company's growth has re-accelerated and is now last quarter was 26% year-over-year um, -year revenue growth, which is really remarkable for a company that's got a revenue run rate of $125 billion today. 
Um, margins as the company have grown have, have remained at a very high and stable level. Um, and not surprisingly, therefore, if margins are stable, earnings just track revenues. Um, so that chart uh, uh, looks a, an awful lot like the revenue chart because mathematically, um, it's going to be identical if margins are steady. Um, earnings will, will just track revenues. Um, so not surprisingly, the stock has uh, been a huge winner over time. Um, and uh, though it's down a little bit, um, at the time we recommended it, it was down about 14% from its peak in early January. Um, it's bounced back a little bit, um, but um, you know, company's just been a huge winner. So in general, we think this is one of the greatest businesses on earth. It just dominates um, its, uh, its, uh, its sectors, has an enormous uh, sustainable competitive advantages. They have seven products with more than a billion monthly average users, search Android Maps, Chrome, YouTube, Google Play, and Gmail. Um, they have 90% of the search market in most countries. Android has 90% of the uh, share of smartphones globally. Um, YouTube serves 20% and growing of all video consumed on the internet, and that is certainly a growth market. Um, so right now, they currently capture 14 to 15% of uh, global advertising spending. Um, and virtually all of the, uh, uh, of the growth is going to uh, Google, basically Google and Facebook. By the way, Glenn, that's 14 to 15% of digital spending, I assume, not all that spending, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, so. Of the incremental, um, all, in, all ad spending incremental growth. Yes. But 14 to 15% of digital ad spend globally. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, we still think there's plenty of room to grow here. It's a it's a 125 billion dollar plus run rate co company, uh, but we think margins are likely to remain stable. Um, we think most of uh, Google's franchises are fairly impregnable, um, and it's just going to keep growing at a very nice rate. And as long as margins uh, stay stable and multiple stays stable, the stock's going to keep going up. Just basically tracking the revenue growth of the business. Now, one of the reasons the stock looks uh, more expensive than it is, is that Google is uh, spending uh, $3.4 billion a year pre-tax last year um, on these other bets from Waymo, the self-driving car that you've probably heard of, um, and a bunch of other businesses. Um, and this is all, uh, you know, this is money where Google does not have to spend this money. In other words, it's uh, the, the core business looks enormously profitable and is enormously profitable, but it's even more profitable uh, than it appears uh, because Google's taking a lot of its profits and uh, gener uh, you know, investing in a lot of wild card stuff. Uh, but Google has a pretty good track record of developing uh, some of these wild cards into enormously valuable businesses. So we're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt here. And I think you have to add back this other bets when you're calculating a multiple uh, for Google. So the last slide here on Google is just a, a lot of details about the valuation. But if you adjust uh, for other bets, if you adjust for the cash hoard, um, which is uh, 50, um, um, $140 a share net, um, uh, and then uh, you um, add back other bets and, and you assign uh, some value to Google, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, to YouTube, um, which is an incredibly valuable franchise. Imagine if Google spun off YouTube, what kind of uh, valuation that company would have. Um, YouTube has incredible characteristics, is growing at an incredible rate, but is currently not super profitable. Um, but I think it will be, it's an incredibly valuable franchise. So if you make adjustments for those things, um, you start to get uh, Google's PE uh, closer to 10 times earnings than 20 times earnings, um, which is remarkable for a company that uh, has, uh, has growth that is still growing at this level. Uh, it's, it's basically one of the world's greatest businesses growing massively faster than the S&P 500, trading at roughly a market or even below market multiple. Uh, let me just move this a little bit here. Um, so. Uh, let's just quickly skip over to Facebook, which is a little bit harder to justify from a valuation perspective as a value guy. Um, but uh, again, uh, it's trading at significantly higher multiples than Google, but it's uh, about a third the size. Um, it's got about a 40, it has a trailing revenues last year, about $40 billion as opposed to well over $100 billion for Google. So it's growing, it's, it's at a smaller base. It's where Google was 10, uh, not 10 years ago, but probably five to 10 years ago. 
Um, so uh, Facebook is, is growing at a much higher rate. You can see here, if, if you can read that slide, basically it's been averaging 50% year over year revenue growth uh, going back uh, for the better part of a decade. Um, and margins are almost double uh, Google's margins, uh, just astronomical margins. Uh, they're stable, even growing um, as the company is growing at uh, revenues of 50% a year. Not surprisingly, this stock has been a monster as well. Um, and what's interesting is, is while the stock is certainly richly valued on traditional valuation metrics, it's not as crazy valued as it used to be. In fact, it's trading right around its lowest multiples ever of earnings, uh, enterprise value to EBITDA and, uh, and revenues. So, um, you know, it's hard to argue something trading at these multiples, you know, uh, you know, well north of 10 times revenues. Um, and north of 20 times, uh, uh, north of 30 times earnings, um, trailing earnings. Uh, when it's growing revenues at uh, almost 50% a year um, and uh, margins are stable, that means earnings are growing 50% a year as well. Um, that revenue multiple compresses awfully rapidly if you think that they can continue to grow uh, at anything close to this kind of rate. Obviously, revenue growth will slow, um, but you know, uh, revenue growth in the first quarter, remember how Facebook uh, came under a lot of uh, criticism, a lot of controversy, um, and people were saying, oh, you know, I'm gonna shut down my Facebook account. Well, the proof is in, and revenue growth accelerated to 49% in the first quarter, um, despite all the talk. So uh, I think this is one of these cases where you gotta set aside uh, the bad press that they've been getting and all the talk, and just look at the numbers, and the numbers are just staggering. So. This is um, sort of this slide uh, here is in their earnings release. Um, in the um, you can pull it up uh, the entire earnings presentation. Just Google it, um, and uh, and basically what it shows is is that in the U.S. and Canada, Facebook is generating about a hundred dollars a year of advertising revenue uh, from all of its users in the U.S. and Canada, and it's generating only a small fraction of that in Europe, about a third of that in Europe which has the same GDP per capita collectively as the US and Canada, but Facebook is only monetizing a small fraction um, there and much, much lower in Asia Pacific and the rest of the world, like one tenth the monetization there um, in the rest of the world. So, um, you know, you have to ask yourself a question. Is anyone gonna displace Facebook? I think not. Um, could it come under regulatory? Is it coming under regulatory? Um, uh, fiat, uh, yes. Uh, so I guess the summary is, is for old value guys like us, uh, you know, we we're seeing it's not pound the table trembling with greed, uh, cheap, either Berkshire or Google or Facebook. On the other hand, um, if you're looking for the foundation of a portfolio, uh, that will, uh, that's likely to do reasonably well over the next five to 10 years, um, and will probably beat the market. Um, I think these would be three of the 10 stocks that I'd own um, and probably tuck away and not look at them except maybe once a year. Uh, so that's sort of the summary of, uh, of these stocks. Uh, so Glenn, should we, um, yeah, I, I wrote down some of the questions I saw. Do you want to, where do you want to start? Let's, um, let's start with, um, so anyone who wants to ask a question, um, just go to the chat. Uh, and just type Glenn is monitoring. And I wrote down a few questions. Um, Let, let's start with, um, we got a couple A couple of people wanted to know, why did it have the great value investors of our time, yeah. Bill Ackman, David Einhorn, Bruce Berkowitz, all hit, um, uh, hit the wall since the great financial crisis? Yeah, yeah. And look, I would put myself uh, not in the same group in, in the sense that I was managing, ever managing that kind of money. Um, they, in the good days, had better track records than I did, um, but, we, but I encountered a lot of the same headwinds uh, some of these smart value guys did. Um, and as I commented earlier, I think part of it is, you know, it seems like the value investing playbook, the traditional value investing playbook hasn't been working so well. Um, I mean, basically, we've been in a market over the last 10 years or so where if you didn't own the big five tech stocks, uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, uh, you've probably trailed the market. On top of that, if you've owned cash, uh, you, that you've trailed the market by even further. And on top of that, if you had a short book, uh, you've trailed the market by even further. So those three things um, have, have sort of been a triple whammy uh, that uh, for a lot of value guys, 
um, who've uh, traditionally waited uh, to invest um, when there's blood in the streets or at least there's some real turmoil out there. There just hasn't been a lot of turmoil. So a lot of us have just been sitting there sucking wind. Um, it's been very frustrating. Um, and you know, we've gone through periods like this before. I can't tell you the carnage among value investors, for example, um, back in 1999, when you know every astroturf.com was going through the roof and traditional value stocks were getting killed. Um, but at least there, there was a lot of stuff to do because as long as you weren't investing in the tech sector and you were looking at stocks outside the nifty 50 and the internet sector, there were loads of cheap stocks. Today, uh, it, things are pretty richly valued across the board. Um, there aren't any huge, obvious pockets of cheapness. Um, and yet, nor are we at extreme valuation levels where, you know, I'd bet a lot of money that the market really tips over in the near term, like I felt at the peak of the internet bubble or the uh, peak of the housing bubble. Uh, so it's just been a really tough environment. But I, I don't think that, you know, just, um, you know, the people and the strategy of sound value investing and just being patient, not being greedy, uh, and looking for uh, undervalued stocks and sort of holding cash and waiting for, to, for, for better days uh, when, when there are going to be really cheap stocks out there. I can, one thing I can promise you is, is there, uh, that there will be uh, stock market downturns, that there will be economic recessions. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, it's pretty clear why a lot of traditional value investors have underperformed. The question is, is uh, are, they, are things ever going to change? Um, and yes, for sure, uh, but I don't know when or how. Okay. Um, I would add to that uh, value investing does not mean that you're entitled to make outsized returns at every point in history. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are worse fates. I mean, you know, the market's going up 10 or 15% and somebody else is uh, practicing conservative investing and they're up 5 or 6%. Well, you know, there are worse things on earth. Um, you know, preserving capital, uh, playing defense and not keeping up with a raging complacent bull market is uh, no shame in my opinion. Uh, I'll tell you, when you're managing other people's money, you can feel a lot of fatigue as it's going on year after year. Okay, um, let's get very specific. A yeah. question on Micron. A couple questions on Micron. Um, huh. A couple years ago, uh, Whitney predicted that Micron would earn uh, $4 a share in a couple of years, um, and it did. How did you develop this prediction? Is Micron now a value trap? It's got a PE of six, and it's estimated to be growing 35% yeah. a year. Yeah, um, so I assume your audio is coming across well. That I don't need to repeat the question, Glenn. Um, so uh, the question is about Micron. Um, uh, you know, I owned it a few years ago. Unfortunately, didn't catch the full ride on it. Um, but uh, you know, the stock is a. It makes semiconductors. Uh, the stock um, has been very cyclical, as the sector has been very cyclical. Right now, things are going gangbusters in the sector, with uh, you know a lot of chips being bought by uh, you know in the trends of artificial intelligence and cloud computing. Um, so. Um, I'm sorry? Bitcoin mining. Yeah, and Bitcoin mining. Thank you, uh, Glenn. Um, so, um, uh, so look, uh, just what I predicted, that the cycle would turn and that the company would earn a lot of money in what is now a global oligopoly with three players controlling about uh, 80, or 80 or 90 percent now of, uh, of these markets. Um, so uh, the question is, is, um, is, is this you know, become a good, has it sort of turned like the railroads have turned, where it used to be a horrible cyclical industry and then the industry consolidated, um, and um, you know, the railroads have now turned into um, um, secular, really great growth businesses with high margins, um, whereas they used to be cyclical. Uh, my sense is, is that there is still uh, an element of cyclicality here. And if you're looking at a cyclical industry, the absolute worst time to own cyclical stocks is when they're trading at the lowest PE multiples, because that's precisely the time that they're trading uh, at peak earnings. Um, that's almost definitional. So um, in the case of Micron, I would not be, uh, I would not be long Micron here. Uh, I don't think it's a good short uh, because this cycle could keep working for a while and earnings are currently uh, exploding to the upside. Uh, but I just read a newsletter, uh, Fred Hickey, the high-tech strategist, is one of my favorite uh, 
newsletters that I've been a subscriber to for 20 years, and Hickey specializes in the tech sector, um, and he uh, is super bearish on Micron, that his channel checks in the industry are showing that inventory is building up, um, and, um, and you don't yet see it in Micron's earnings, but he thinks you're going to. Um, so this is one I'd be real uh, cautious about. Um, we've had a number of questions dealing with getting started, both as yeah. an individual investor and also getting uh, into the industry. Um, and uh, interestingly, some of the questions came from some women who recognize the hedge fund industry as uh, very male-centric. Yeah. So how does a, uh, a young investor get started? And how does a uh, young person get into the industry? Yeah, um, well, there are a couple different questions because one is, is just how do you uh, sort of get a job and get trained uh, as an investor if you want to do it as a job? And the, uh, the related question, which I'm sure some people are asking is, is, okay, how do you start your own fund? You know, I started with a million dollars out of my bedroom for the first five years, grew it to about $40 million. And then uh, Glenn joined me and we took it up to about a, a $200 million and we really hit it in the first 12 years. Um, and that's what every, you know, bootstrap entrepreneurial um, uh, money manager is, aspires to do. Um, very, very, very few people do it. Very few people sort of start with almost no experience in the industry like I did um, and, uh, and start with a million dollars and ever go above $10 million, much less $100 million, much less $200 million. So. Um, that's one of the things we teach in our um, How to Launch and Build an Investment Fund seminar is what are the things we did right to really break out and to really hit it? Um, and then, by the way, what are some of the things we did wrong to, um, to, uh, to lose that? Um, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, my advice is not to, in terms of, uh, I'm going to answer the second question first, which is how do you like start your own fund? Um, it's, uh, is the real question is, is should you go out and start your own fund? Because most people who want to do it probably shouldn't. Um, I shouldn't have gone out and start, started my own fund when I did uh, because I hadn't put in my time. It's an, it's an experience-based business. The experience is gained through apprenticeship. So it's the same way, how do you become a brain surgeon? Uh, well, the answer is, is you go to college and medical school, you get a lot of foundational training, but then um, you go and you're an intern, uh, and then you work with an experienced surgeon, um, and you spend uh, five or ten years um, in the operating room and get gaining increasing responsibility um, over time and learning how to do it from uh, a master. Um, and so that's my primary advice to most people. And even then, um, you've spent five or 10 years gaining all that experience, learning at the feet of a master does not mean you should go out and start your own funds. Um, most people are probably pretty well suited to just continue working as a senior analyst and senior portfolio manager in the context of a bigger fund and let somebody else deal with uh, the office lease and hiring people and dealing with investors and all of that. It really requires a, a real entrepreneurial skill set, completely separate from an investing skill set. You got to have both uh, to, to make it if you're actually going to start your own business. So that's a quick summary answer to those with entrepreneurial aspirations. Um, turning to the first question, which is just generally, how do you learn and become a better investor? Well, obviously, never ask a barber if you need a haircut. I would tell you to uh, take our courses uh, um, and our three-day Lessons from the Trenches Investing Boot Camp is, is a real crash course on the investing side, not just how do you find good stocks, but how do you identify and avoid value traps. Uh, portfolio management is an absolutely critical skill that can add or destroy as much value as stock picking over time. In other words, how big do you size positions? Um, uh, if a stock gets cut in half, what do you do? If a stock doubles, what do you do? Um, should you own a stock uh, or should you own options or should you own the debt? Um, you know, port those portfolio management decisions are critical. Um, learning about short selling, even if you never do it, is critical. Learning uh, about activism, even if you never do it, is really critical. Uh, uh, one of the questions I saw, by the way, was, is, is you know, what, when, when would you recommend being an activist? And the answer for the vast majority of people is never. Um, it's very time consuming. It exposes you uh, to all sorts of legal and regulatory risk. 
uh, companies can come after you. Um, and generally speaking, um, it's for 99% of people, much better to be do what I call piggybacking on activism, which is figure out who the best activists are who are effective in unlocking value, and then looking at the companies that they get involved with, and don't blindly follow anybody into a position, but uh, you know, we've made some pretty good money. For example, I talked earlier about um, Bill Ackman and his uh, successful activism with Wendy's uh, more than a decade ago and persuading them to spin off Tim Hortons. Another example from the Ackman playbook would be Canadian Pacific. Um, or one of Ackman's uh, former analysts um, and college roommate, Paul Hilal of uh, Mantle Ridge, um, he uh, took Hunter Harrison out of uh, Canadian Pacific, went over to CSX, um, and been an activist there uh, very effectively. That stock's done extremely well. So finding smart activists and following them into uh, high probability situations, and that's the key. Which ones are high probability? Because some activists uh, fail utterly and the stock uh, it, uh, does very poorly. So um, I'm digressing a little bit from the question is, is you know, how do you build your investment skill set? Um, uh, doing a lot of reading, uh, going out there and actually investing your own capital. Even if you only have a few thousand dollars, just set up an E-Trade or Ameritrade account and pick five stocks and start doing it. Even if you're still in college or you're young and don't know that much, make sure it's a very small amount of money that you can afford to lose, but go out there and start getting experience. Uh, start reading uh, uh, um, smart stock write-ups on Seeking Alpha, Value Investors Club, and Sum Zero are three of my favorite websites. Um, uh, start going to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, start reading uh, everything ever written by or about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Um, and, uh, and then there, uh, there are now a number of conferences out there. Um, there aren't very many teaching seminars. What Glenn and I are doing here at Case Learning is pretty unique. Um, but you know, there are a half dozen conferences, particularly if you live in the New York area, that you can attend in person. Um, go out to the Berkshire meeting, go out to Charlie Munger's Daily Journal meeting, which is generally the second Wednesday in February out in Los Angeles, um, and uh, read Poor Charlie's Almanac, the book I uh, helped write uh, about Charlie Munger and his wisdom, and uh, go back and read all the Buffett partnership letters. There's almost an infinite amount of reading and learning you can do on your own, but at the end of the day, finding a job with someone, a full-time job where someone will train you. Um, and you can learn the business uh, under their tutelage is by far the best way, uh, both to become a good investor and to learn the entrepreneurial stuff you need if you ever want to start your own business. So you talked about the piggybacking on activism. Yeah. Um, what about ideas that you get from other people? How do you decide which ones to invest in? Yeah, I remember back in the day, you know, 20 years ago when I was first starting, finding a good investment idea was uh, a really valuable thing. Um, and when I, uh, I would search super hard um, and there weren't any conferences, there wasn't any uh, real internet or websites. Um, and uh, so finding a good investment idea was an incredible challenge. It was a big part of my value add. That's completely reversed today. Um, we are now drowning in investment ideas. Literally every day, I see more, more than 10 investment ideas a day, generally by very smart people, um, written up on uh, some zero uh, seeking alpha uh, value investors club, uh, pitched at conferences. Um, you know, it's uh, with the internet, we're, we're drowning not just in information, but as a manifestation of that, we're drowning in uh, stock ideas. Um, and now there are a lot of high profile, there's so many more hedge funds than there used to be. Investors are now much more willing to talk and write about their, um, about their ideas. So the real challenge today is not to find good, well-articulated investment ideas by smart people, but how do you, um, you know, how do you filter? Uh, how do you, it's like drinking from a fire hose. How do you filter that? Um, and the answer is, is it's hard. Um, and you got to do your own work um, and it helps to have a framework like the one I outlined earlier. You know, first question is, is circle of competence. Um, and second question is, is company industry analysis. Third question is management and fourth is valuation. And uh, after you've been doing this for a while, uh, you, you, uh, this is why it's an experience based business. You can very quickly process a large number of ideas and quickly focus it down on the ones that are really worth investing time on. Time allocation is now a much more important skill than, uh, than uh, sourcing, sourcing ideas. 
So we got a question that I'm going to answer. Um, it's a pretty technical question, but I think here, it's important. Come, come stand up here and, and you, can, you can have the, the screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the question is when determining uh, ROIC, return on invested capital, uh, for companies that rely on research, should research be incorporated in the uh, ROIC calculation? And the answer is all calculations of value should be oriented towards the cash that a business will generate. This is a really important question because in today's technology businesses, capital expenditures are much less important um, and therefore depreciation and amortization is less, much less important. And most of what's analogous to capital expenditures is really research and development expenditures, which goes through the balance sheet instead of going through the cash flow statement. So the answer is you should do apples to apples when comparing two different businesses in two different industries. Um, and in fact, tech businesses have more conservative accounting because their income statement is going to much closer align with the cash flow statements than a company that's got a lot of capital expenditures to throw at it. So the point I was trying to make is simply when valuing a company, um, skew your analysis towards the cash that's going to get generated, not um, gap, because often gap will um, uh, will will skew events, uh, will skew uh, results in, in 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 negative ways. Um, that's really the only one I wanted. Right. To... I'm going to leave you up there and, and throw another question on sure. the message board, which is somebody said. Um, isn't it good to invest in companies with a lot of debt because if they're generating cash flows, they're paying down the debt and it's being, uh, the value is being transferred from the debt holders to the equity holders and you can have Lollapalooza effects investing in heavily indebted companies. Yes, so there's a lot of ways to incorporate debt into a investment structure. One is to use uh, portfolio leverage. One is to invest through options. One is to invest in companies that have a lot of debt on them. And if you think about it, an option is just a synthetic way of superimposing debt on a company's capital structure that's not as levered as you think it optimally will be. I think all three of those will get you in trouble. And the reason all three of those will get you in trouble is in general, we see investors are not great about evaluating the downside. They're not great about uh, the variability that's gonna be um, experienced in, in a business and frankly in the valuation of a business, the, the market value of a business. So in a company that is, um, that is levered, they are going to have fewer and fewer um, moves. So for example, Valiant had uh, $30 billion, $30 billion plus of debt on it and it generated real cash flow. It generated probably $2 billion a year of, of, of cash flow, but $2 billion is not a big number uh, compared to 30 and a sliver of a misstep um, can cause the company to go from $200 a share down to, to, uh, to $12 a share. Now, Valiant's a much more complicated story than that. Um, but if it was a purely equitized business, uh, the variability would not been, have been uh, nearly as great. So yes, there's Lollapalooza effects. That's what leverage is. Leverage is gonna magnify the upside. It's gonna magnify the downside. Um, great companies don't need leverage in order to generate great returns. Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook have generated enormous returns um, without the use of uh, massive amounts of leverage. So that's sort of my, my view on leverage. You mentioned Valiant. We did get a question about, did we look at Valiant when it hit its lows? Um, and you know, what, you know, was it a good buy down at $8? Um, what do we think of it now? At, you know, it's about 20 now. I think it's approaching 30. Yeah. Um, we looked at it at 100, we looked at it at eight, we looked at it at 30, um, and we continue to look at it. Um, Valiant is still um, in intensive care, uh, in my estimation. Uh, Whitney might feel somewhat uh, differently no, no, about no. it. Exactly um, it has stopped um, bleeding as badly as it had been bleeding, but there were a lot of games that were played at Valiant. Um, we have a very extensive case that we go through in our, uh, in our course. Um, uh, to understand the financials there. Uh, and the financials are just too complicated and it is still an extremely levered uh, situation. Um, and the sustainability of the cash flows based on the, um, uh, the, the, the lifespan of the drugs and the, pro uh, the products that they, uh, they have um, makes, it, makes it a little bit of a tough investment. There are other 
better situations uh, from uh, from the way I, I look at the world. Uh, they, they've done some good things, but if you look at the leverage, I don't know, I think it's still 25 billion or something like that. Um, so for Whitney, the next question that I'm gonna ask you is, Ben Graham uh, started with cigar butts and Buffett and Munger. By the way, we're not just asking each other questions back and forth. These are the questions, that, these are your questions coming in over the chat. Um, <laughs> in case you think two egos have run amok here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Ben Graham started with cigar butts. Yes. Buffett and Munger moved it to valuing business franchises. What's next? I mean, I, I'm not sure there is a next um, valuing. I mean, I guess it depends on when you say valuing business franchises, meaning, you know, investing in very high quality blue chip companies. Um, uh, and to some extent, I think Buffett and Munger moved in that direction because their size of Berkshire Hathaway forced them to move in that direction. Berkshire has become so large that they can only look at maybe, I don't know, the hundred largest companies in the world to invest in, maybe a couple hundred. And therefore, if, you're, if, you're, if your investment universe by size, because you're so big, is constrained to just those enormously large companies, uh, then, uh, uh, then by definition, well, which ones would you rather own? Generally speaking, you want to own the higher quality franchises with strong brands, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to the you know, beaten up turnaround situations where you, you know, sort of try and buy them cheap and then sell them when they rally a bit or something like that. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not sure the lessons for them and these big picture questions are that relevant to us uh, or to, to the folks on this call. Um, we don't have the high class problem of managing uh, north of a hundred billion dollar uh, portfolio. Um, I mean, that's Berkshire has more than a hundred billion of cash. They have almost a $200 billion stock portfolio. And then, um, uh, so, so, you know, they, they're, they're really uh, gargantuan. Um, you know, Buffett and Munger have a high class problem that none of us have. We can choose to invest in some of the bigger quality franchises like Berkshire and Facebook and Google. Um, but we can also, I think if you're gonna be out there picking stocks, you should be trying to look around the companies that don't have 40 analysts following them. And in particular, if you can develop expertise in a particular industry, the more obscure, the better, and in a particular country. So, you know, I have a lot of investors come to our seminars. Uh, they fly in from around the world, from uh, Singapore, Mumbai, uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Australia. And uh, those are much less developed markets. They're not as efficient as the U.S. market. And I tell them, you should go back home and become a real expert on India and look at uh, publicly traded stocks, not the top 100 in the, in the Indian Stock Exchange, the Infosys of the world that are owned by all the global investors and trade at high multiples. Go look at the companies that do not report their financials in English, where your knowledge of the local language uh, gives you an advantage. And by the way, I know investors in Israel and Eastern Europe and Africa, and I tell them the same thing. Go become a specialist in your home country uh, where you have a language advantage, etc. cetera. Um, so that would, be, that would be my answer to that. By the way, I, I do recall seeing one of the questions on the chat. Somebody said, you know, how, do you, how, how many can you have an edge, um, you know, competing against uh, so many other big funds, you know, isn't it just sort of impossible for uh, and research you know, analysts. And all the research analysts, um, but it's not the research analysts. Uh, you can compete against the, them all day long because they're inherently conflicted. Um, some people would say corrupted. Um, by their firms need to do banking business with these customers, which is where they really make money, not on their stock recommendations. Um, so, so it's not the stock analysts you're competing against. It's the, um, it's the index funds, but it's the big hedge funds. Um, you, you have no idea the kind of resources these multi-billion dollar hedge funds have to hire investigative uh, reporters, to hire data services, satellite uh, imagery, uh, credit card uh, usage data that can give them a legal edge, an informational edge. Um, and then the quant funds, a place like Two Sigma, you know, which is, uh, or Medallion, Renaissance Capital, um, that have been putting up huge numbers with uh, their supercomputers, where they have an army of PhDs uh, looking for market inefficiencies um, and programming these supercomputers. And I really believe um, that, that humans' biggest challenge is competing against the, the computers. Uh, I don't know that world super well, but my general view is, is 
that over the past few years, supercomputers now trounce human beings at virtually all the things that human beings used to be much better at than supercomputers, like chess, like the game Go, um, and increasingly uh, driving a car. 99% um, of the time, computers will drive cars now better than humans. Uh, so, uh, so um, our, um, you know, my sense is, is that the computers out there in the stock market are becoming similarly smart. The computers used to just be momentum following, you know, sort of, uh, if anything, they created uh, opportunities for value investors because in following momentum, uh, they would run stocks down well below intrinsic value. Um, and so I could buy them even cheaper than I otherwise could. And then when momentum turned, I could buy them well above intrinsic value. Uh, so, but I think today um, the supercomputers are a lot smarter and stocks that should be getting much cheaper are not getting that cheap. And I think part of that is we're just in a complacent environment and a business like Equifax has a huge data breach and the CEO gets fired and the stock's down 25%. But then I take a close look and, you know, it's gone from 35, earning, uh, 35 times earnings to 25 times earnings or something. It's not even close to being cheap, in my opinion. Uh, so, so part of that's just human beings willing to step in. But I also think it's computers, um, you know, that are practicing value investing. So what's, you know, how can you possibly compete? Um, by trying to milk all of those advantages that I laid out earlier. Um, take advantage of your size and look in the nooks and crannies. Uh, um, you know, use time arbitrage. The supercomputers are programmed by humans. The humans are programming them to try and make money quickly. So if you can uh, apply some patience and look out two to three years, um, I think you can compete. Developing industry contacts and deep industry knowledge um, is, is another way to compete in this world. Um, so, but keep in mind at all times, anytime you are buying a stock, it is an act of arrogance. It is, I call it, I once wrote a column entitled, The Arrogance of Stock Picking. Because by definition, anytime you're buying a stock, you are making the bet that you're right and that your prediction of the future is correct relative to everybody else out there in the market. Um, and uh, that's an act of arrogance. It, it's not just confidence, that's an act of arrogance. So you just better be comfortable with that and you better be uh, very sure that you're right and that everybody else is wrong. And that sort of requires a degree of humility. And there's the tension in investing, which is do you have, you have to be arrogant. By definition, every stock you buy is an act of arrogance. On the other hand, you have to marry that with humility. And I can tell you the vast majority of the people in the investing field, especially those um, uh, running funds and running big funds, and they've been uh, gotten wealthy and successful, um, they've got the arrogance down pat. They just don't have the humility, and that can get all of us into a lot of trouble. Okay. From a, to, a, uh, to a more practical question that I, I uh, sense some frustration with. Uh, investors only care about high ROIC and high margin companies, and they think of those as high quality. Um, but don't these businesses have nowhere to go but down? Isn't it better to invest in a company at six times EBITDA and one times revenue with opportunities to improve its performance? Yeah. So the question is, is uh, you know, the argument is, is there are only two kinds of businesses. Those that are having problems or those that are going to have problems, which would you rather own? Um, and generally speaking, you know, most value guys like me, uh, like us, are drawn to businesses that are encountering problems. And basically, we're trying, we're betting on a turnaround. Uh, the problem is, is that for at least the past 10 years, um, you've instead been rewarded just for buying businesses that are kicking butt, and you're just betting that they continue to kick even more butt going forward. The Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, you know, uh, and Apples of the world. Um, and that's uh, sort of frustrating for we value folks. Um, uh, so the question is, is, you know, it depends. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I guess I personally have, sort of have a little bit of a bias um, toward buying stuff that's sort of beaten down, that's sort of statistically cheap. Uh, but on the other hand, I had too much of a bias for that. And it caused me to miss uh, things that were right there in front of my nose, um, you know, like Google and Facebook. Um, were obviously insanely great businesses. And Buffett and Munger, a, a little over a year ago at the Berkshire meeting, were beating themselves up for missing Google. They sort of chortled um, and said, you know, how did we miss that one? We at Geico were paying uh, uh, Google $10 a click 
And they sort of shook their heads and said, a click. I mean, the cost to Google of uh, associated with that $10 of revenue per click is basically zero. It's a 100% pre-tax incremental profit margin business. Um, and that kind of thing just hasn't existed before in the history of the world, in the history of business. Uh, so, um, so, you know, I, they said that they should have been able to figure it out. And you know what? I'm younger. I use the, uh, I'm more tech savvy than they are. I certainly should have been able to figure it out. But instead, I was just sort of hung up on, you know, uh, buying statistically cheap stocks. Um, so, look, I think building a portfolio, um, you should have a portfolio of different types of value investments. And, uh, you know, maybe some big cap blue chips that are sort of 80 cent dollars, um, you know, 85 cent dollars, like a Berkshire or maybe a Google, uh, maybe a couple little bit more aggressive growth stocks uh, like, a, like a Facebook. Um, uh, but then also have some more obscure small cap stuff, uh, a little bit off the radar screen and some statistically cheap stuff, um, you know, building, building that kind of portfolio. So you have a portfolio that will do well in a lot of different kinds of markets. This one um, seems appropriate for you. Sure. Why do smart people go on TV and say, with full of confidence, and say really dumb things? <laughs> uh, for example, Alibaba is a short at 70, according to Jim Chanos, and it now trades at 200. Or David Einhorn saying that Sun Edison is misunderstood um, and it went to zero. Right. Um, look, it's very easy, and uh, I've, I've certainly done this myself. I have gone on national television and said that I thought J.C. Penney was a good buy at twenty-eight dollars. Um, so you know, uh, I, I, I've got uh, my skeletons in, in my closet as well. Um, and look, um, the the lesson here, though, is is that even the world's smartest investors occasionally uh, are wrong. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of schadenfreude out there when people are, be, are very successful and become very rich. Um, and then they, uh, you know, write publicly or go on national television and say something and it proves, that, proves to be spectacularly wrong. You know, everybody sort of laughs at them. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, but I think the lesson, though, is a good one, which is you shouldn't follow anybody. I don't care what their track record is uh, into any stock. Uh, you know, nobody admires Warren Buffett more than I do. Um, and I never even considered falling into IBM. And in fact, I wrote to him and I said publicly that I thought that was a value trap. Um, and uh, uh, um, in the case of Apple, I think it'll do fine, but I think on almost every dimension, I like Google better than Apple. Um, so I bought Google, uh, and, uh, but I took a hard look at Apple. Anytime, some, anytime Buffett and Munger buy a publicly traded stock that I could buy, I take a hard look and other smart investors, uh, you know, that's a good source of ideas is looking at people who uh, I've studied them closely. I know the kind of research they do. I know the quality of their thinking. Um, and when I see them put on a big position, that's a great new stock for me to look at. But at the end of the day, um, just blindly following anybody into anything is a recipe for disaster. How do you identify businesses and industries that will be significantly terminally disrupted and how do you identify them early before they crash? Sears, Blockbusters, Radio Shack, yeah. Toys R Us. What's the next business to get disrupted? Yeah. Um, yeah, disruption is happening, it seems like, everywhere. And even businesses you wouldn't think would be disrupted by technology. Think of uh, Kraft Heinz, uh, you know, uh, Campbell's Soup, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble, just making basic shampoo and diapers and stuff are still getting disrupted now. Um, so I do think that a lot of these mega cap branded companies, um, I, don't, I think they're going to continue to pound out a ton of cash, but... Uh, you know, I am not, uh, I took a look at Coca-Cola recently and er uh, revenues and profits have declined for five consecutive years. Profits defined as operating income. Yet it still trades at six times revenues, um, uh, what, well north of 20 times earnings, right? Or even 30, about closer to 30 times earnings, Glenn. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of companies out there, I think, that are sort of being valued based on a 3.7% dividend like Coke pays. Um, or based on, you know, it's, a, it's an insanely great cash flowing business. 
but uh, I don't think you're going to do well owning the stock. Uh, so I would say sort of big consumer products companies are likely to be slowly, not rapidly, but slowly melting ice cubes uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, now look, if the stocks get cheap enough, um, you know, they're still generating a ton of cash and that gives them a lot of flexibility to buy back stock or go private or something uh, like that. Um, so they're certainly not good shorts in my opinion, but um, you might, if you own these kind of stocks, you might want to take a fresh look and say, you know, is their future going to be as rosy as their past? And in most cases, probably not. Um, but look, in most cases, these things, uh, look, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond didn't go from 80 to 20 on a, on a rope. It went from 80 to 20. It's a, been a slowly bleeding company for years now. The stock's been just steadily declining for years. You don't have to be a genius and pick the top um, or figuring out which industries might get disrupted. Just look at the nose in front of your face and you can see it's, it's there in the financials. You can see it walking the malls. You can look at your own family spending patterns and ask yourself, you know, the kinds of things Bed Bath & Beyond is selling. When was the last time you actually went to Bed Bath & Beyond to buy those things? And the answer is, is almost never. Uh, for years now, my family and my wife, my three daughters, um, have been buying almost uh, the, the amount of shifting that has gone of our consumer spending uh, from bricks and mortar uh, to the internet, uh, particularly to Amazon, has been going on in my family every single year that's been shifting significantly for the last 20 years, every single year without exception. Um, so this wasn't something that should have snuck up on anybody. Okay, a couple of Berkshire questions. Um, why do you think Berkshire will outperform the market over the next 15 years when it has underperformed over the last 10 to 15 years? Will, why is Buffett holding on to $100 billion? He'll never be able to spend that. Um, why not subtract taxes out of the cash and investments when doing your calculation? All right, I'm gonna let you answer the third question. I'll answer the first two. Um, so first of all, Berkshire hasn't underperformed. It's, um, I, literally, I have a stock chart in my full Berkshire presentation, which is at tilsonfunds.com slash BRK, all caps, BRK.pdf. Um, and there's a stock chart there tracking Berkshire stock. Um, the stock went down a little bit less than the market during the downturn. And then from the day the market bottomed on March 9th of 2009, it has exactly tracked the market. Um, so the stock has gone from about $75,000 a share to about $300,000 a share. It's quadrupled and so has the S&P 500 with dividends. Um, so um, I think it's actually quite remarkable that a company um, that is so uh, conservatively financed and conservatively run has been able to keep up with this long bull market. There are very few value investors or value investments uh, that, that have done so. Um, so uh, and I think it will outperform in the downturn because it's so conservative, uh, if and when, a, well, not if, when the downturn, a, a downturn comes. Um, so the question though is, is okay, it's sitting on a big pile of cash, uh, that gives Buffett a lot of dry powder to invest in the downturn, but in the meantime, it's sort of an anchor, and what's he gonna do with it? Well, part of the, the answer is, is he's probably gonna sit on it, uh, quite a bit of it. Um, Berkshire, I would expect, is going to be very cash rich um, for the foreseeable future, um, but Buffett put $80 billion to work in 2008 when the market um, got hairy. Um, in very short order. He put over $30 billion into Burlington Northern. He put over $30 billion into precision cast parts. Um, he's regularly doing you know, $10 billion deals here and there. Um, how much did he put into Kraft Heinz, the two deals there? Um, $25. Yeah, $25 billion. So uh, $112 billion uh, is a lot of money, but uh, this is Warren Buffett and he sees a lot of things and he will act decisively. Uh, in, in, in speed and in size uh, um, when something big comes along. And he's acknowledged and everyone with a, an ounce of brains understands that this is not a super favorable environment to putting a lot of money to, to work in extremely compelling ideas. But, you know, he's willing to put money to work in utilities and pipelines and um, the reinvestment that's going on back into Berkshire's business uh, is pretty enormous. Um, and will generate good returns. So, uh, look, we're not pounding the table that Berkshire is somehow totally misunderstood or screaming cheap here. Uh, but um, how will Berkshire outperform the market? 
um, the exact same way it has uh, is, is the market is unlikely to go up uh, on a straight line and quadruple again over the next 10 years or nine years. I would say, in fact, that odds of that, I would put it less than 10%, probably less than 5% that the next nine years the market steadily quadruples like it's done the last nine years. Um, and so the fact that Berkshire's kept up in probably the least favorable environment for a company in a stock like Berkshire, um, I think Berkshire is likely to outperform if there's some turmoil out there, both because Berkshire is viewed as a defensive holding, it will hold up better, but two, because Buffett can put some of that cash hoard to work. So Glenn, talk about um, Berkshire's taxes and why you don't subtract that out. Okay. so. So uh, Berkshire has um, uh, holdings in, say, Coca-Cola that have uh, created substantial, uh, a substantial tax liability that uh, will be realized when um, and if uh, Berkshire sells uh, Coca-Cola. So if they were to liquidate their entire portfolio tomorrow, uh, we would deduct the entire tax liability in our valuation. Um, they're not going to uh, liquidate it tomorrow. Um, let's say they're going to hold Coca-Cola forever. Uh, well, they're going to get the dividends uh, from Coca-Cola forever, and this tax liability will um, stay on the books forever. So the dividends will keep coming in, so you, they'll, they'll have the effective ownership um, benefits of uh, Coca-Cola, and they will never realize any liability associated with it. So those are the two bounds. You're either going to count it 100% if they hold all of the stocks today, or you're going to count it 0% if they're um, if they're going to sell today, and you're going to count it 0% if they're going to hold the stocks um, forever. Uh, the way we think about it is if if Berkshire is going to sell a stock today and, and, and realize the tax liability, that means that from an intrinsic value perspective, they are going to be giving away something, and the only reason they do that is because they're going to invest in something else, and the something else will definitionally have a greater intrinsic value than what they give away, because otherwise, why would they do it? So if they're going to be investing in something with a greater intrinsic value than the net after-tax proceeds, then it's essentially a wash with the deferred taxes, and that's why we don't count it. All right, um, someone just popped in a question. What's our view of platform holdings? Um, and you'd like me to answer that? You betcha. Platform Holdings um, is a uh, chemical, especially chemical company. Um, it has uh, a tremendous amount of leverage and has not been generating a lot of uh, free cash flow. And it has been, um, it's acquired, it acquired companies at what people think to be very high multiples um, in that industry. So it's been a troubled situation um, for the sponsors, uh, which include Ackman um, and, and Martin Franklin, who is the operating sponsor. Um, Martin's a very, very successful uh, operating entrepreneur. Um, and we have great respect for him and, and, and in general, um, a good confidence in him. Um, it's going to be, it's a workout situation, not in the context of being uh, insolvent or anything like that, but they've got to um, essentially grow into their, their capital structure, into their debt structure. They're making progress along those lines. There's been discussions about splitting the company in two, taking one part public, selling one part. That would be uh, a, a very beneficial uh, delevering transaction as well. Um, I personally wouldn't put fresh capital uh, into platform today at its uh, current prices based on my most recent analysis, um, but that's just as a, uh, a regular way uh, stock investor. Do you feel any differently? No. Um, I love the people. Um, I love the CEO and Martin Franklin and Bill Ackman, I think, are very, very smart, but I think um, the company's got a fair amount of debt and uh, it's risky. It's a, if you're gonna, it, I, I wouldn't argue with someone who had it as a 3% position in their fund. They can um, actually see us interrupting all right, now. All right, here we go. Um, so I got an interesting question there is, is, um, should we value high growth companies differently? Um, you know, uh, some of these, you know, companies like Facebook and all, they've just traded at very high multiples, yet the stocks have just been big home runs. Um, and the answer, like most things is, is there's no simple answer here. There's, uh, there's, uh, um, and the answer is it depends. And what it, it, it the question, the, here's what I would say. Historically speaking, there's a lot of evidence that if you just go out there and buy 
the uh, all the stocks trading in the highest 10 percent um, in terms of PE multiple and growth rates for example um, take either one of those that is a disastrous investment strategy because typically those companies um, are trading with extremely high expectations built into them um, and uh, we live in a capitalist system where there are always new competitors, there's lots of disruption, and very, very, very few companies uh, can maintain a high growth rate for a long period of time. And so it's very easy in your mind to say, oh, you know, it was just so obvious that I just should have bought Google and Facebook and Amazon uh, and Netflix five years ago. Um, but the answer is for every Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and Netflix five years ago, there were lots and lots of other stocks that were really great companies and growth these stocks and all, where um, they got disrupted, uh, they, uh, things changed, growth slowed, and those stocks have been very poor performers even in this environment. And the other thing to keep in mind is, look, growth stocks, and um, uh, you know, for the past nine years, the less you focused on valuation, the more, uh, the higher the multiple you paid, the more risk you took, the more you have been rewarded. And it is very, very, very important not to learn the wrong lessons uh, from a nine-year bull market. It's precisely when everybody is saying, oh yeah, you know, just don't worry about valuation, just buy growth, you know, buy the latest hot IPOs, and hey, throw in some Bitcoin for diversification. It's precisely when that becomes the consensus view that it's a pretty darn good signal that things are about to shift and a lot of uh, bull market geniuses are gonna get their heads handed to them. Uh, I saw it especially in 1999, um, and you know you saw it again to almost a decade, eight years after that, at the peak of the financial bubble in 2007, um, and you're seeing it again today. But that's uh, that's not to say I have any idea, you know, when this is going to happen, when uh, recklessness and risk taking will be punished rather than rewarded in the market. Um, you know what, Glenn? If we can. Um, uh, I want to take a little um, a detour, and then we're going to come back to investing. But I'm in the process, uh, so I'm uh, the reason I'm coming up here is is um, I want to pull up a uh, slide presentation that I've put together um, that's on a book that I'm writing um, uh, called um, Beyond Value Investing: Life Lessons I've Learned from Warren uh, Life Lessons from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, parentheses, and me. Um, and I'm, uh, I've, I've mostly written it. It's probably coming out a couple months from now. Um, and in it, uh, the theory, what inspired me to write the book is, is I just attended my 21st consecutive Berkshire meeting. Uh, I'm no longer um, in the business of managing other people's money. Uh, yet, uh, I'm still going out to the Berkshire meeting. And part of it is, is because what I realized is, is over more than two decades, of uh, uh, obsessively almost studying Buffett and Munger, going to every West Coast meeting, Daily Journal meeting, certainly every Berkshire meeting, um, that I've learned uh, these old guys have probably made more of a difference in my life outside of investing uh, than they have, uh, and, and they've taught me everything I know about investing. So uh, what I wanted to do was pull up um, uh, one of the slide presentations uh, that, um, uh, that, that I created that was inspired by Charlie Munger. Um, and let me, um, let me pull it up here. Um, and I'm going to bear with me just a second here. Um, here we go. Um, it's a, it's a slide presentation here on the calamities. Uh, uh, um, and this is the, the subtitle of my book. Um, Life Lessons from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and, and me. So the book is not all about calamities, uh, but, uh, but this is one section of the book. And what I want to do is uh, just quickly run through some of the highlights of it, um, and in particular focus on marriage, because uh, if we were teaching this in a room in person, I would ask for a show of hands um, and ask for, you know, how many of you are single, and, you know, some percentage of the hands would go up, and how many of you are married, and the rest of the hands would go up. And then I'd say, okay, great, I've got a presentation uh, that, are, that is relevant to all of you. So let me, uh, I'm going to quickly skip ahead to um, uh, the theory behind, uh, uh, behind this is, um, is, is uh, what Charlie Munger said at the Wesco meeting years ago. And he said, all I want to know is where I'm going to die so I never go there. And everybody sort of laughed. And he said, you know, no, I'm actually serious. And what I mean by this is 
that once you've reached a certain position in life, um, you should uh, what you should be focused on is, is how not to screw it up and lose what you've got. Uh, um, and those were pretty profound words. And in the almost two decades since uh, I heard him say those words, uh, I probably spent more than my fair share of time thinking uh, about what are the calamities that could uh, derail my life? Um, and so I've written uh, probably the last third of my book is this presentation. Um, and I think I've boiled down, certainly this is from uh, some of my own experience, but an awful lot of observation of friends and family and just reading the newspapers and seeing how successful, happy people lose that. Um, and it's sort of a depressing topic to think about, but in the same way we study investing mistakes as investors, and that's really important to being a good investor, is avoiding mistakes. Um, it's really important to lead a happy life is to avoid the things that can make your life really miserable. So uh, I, I boiled it down into five big categories. Uh, the number one thing, obviously, that will wreck your life uh, is, is uh, death or serious injury of your own or a loved one. Number two is not actually divorce, but it's actually the 10 years prior to divorce. It's being in a bad marriage. Um, you know, sometimes divorce is almost always a calamity, but usually it's the tail end. It's often the release valve of the bigger calamity of being trapped in a, in a miserable marriage. Uh, number three is, is losing your reputation. Uh, uh, if that's accompanied by breaking the law, you can also simultaneously lose your freedom. Um, losing number four is losing all your money, investing recklessly uh, once you've made some money, and lastly, uh, addiction or abuse. Um, so I just want to, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I've got all sorts of stuff here on death and serious injury um, and about eating healthily and staying fit, um, things you can do uh, to cancer screening, avoiding tail risks, um, suicide, and why you shouldn't have a gun in your home. Uh, I'm not quarreling with the Second Amendment or your right to have a gun in your home. I'm saying uh, just particularly in the past week where there have been two very high profile suicides, um, the single greatest uh, risk of having uh, a gun around is, is that someone, you or a loved one, will use it to commit suicide. Um, uh, investing in a safe car. My wife was in a, she fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident that fortunately there was no injury at all, but could, if they, when you fall asleep at the wheel, you're rolling the dice with possible death. Um, and that really uh, inspired me uh, to, uh, to uh, tell everyone I know, if you can afford uh, a, a new or a newer model car that has the latest safety features, you should do so. Um, so I've got lots more details about that uh, in this presentation. Um, and so let's, uh, let's uh, flip over to marriage. Um, the most important decision most people will make in their life in terms of determining their long-term happiness is marrying the right person. Uh, so what's the single most important thing you can do uh, to marry the right person is, uh, by definition, great people don't marry non-great people. And so if you want to marry a great person, you've got to be a great person yourself. You're probably not going to fool a great person into marrying you if you're a real turkey. Uh, so look in a mirror um, and uh, make yourself a, a great person that a great another great person would want to marry. Um, again, simple in concept, easy, uh, simple in, in concept, but very difficult in practice. So um, next idea is obviously go out there and choose carefully um, and, uh, and fish in the right ponds. Uh, and uh, if you come across uh, warning flags, um, pay attention to them because this isn't like investing where you can build a portfolio and if you make a mistake, you can just sell a stock or something. Uh, the bar should be very high for investing. The bar has to be much, much, much higher in terms of marriage, someone you're going to have children with in all likelihood and hopefully spend, um, you know, 50 to 80 years together. Um, you, you'd uh, better have a super high bar and be very sensitive to warning flags and disconfirming information and don't hesitate to walk away even after you're already engaged. Um, so here, um, I'm not going to read through all the 12 questions, but of all the slides I ever present, this one probably attracts the most interest, certainly from people who are single. Um, these are the 12 questions that I've, it's actually more than 12 questions, but I've sort of boiled it down into 12 because I like that nice round number. Um, the questions to ask yourself before when you're deciding whether to marry somebody. And so they're in rough order of priority. Um, uh, I'll read you the first one, but again, I'll send these slides around or they are posted right now on the internet um, at uh, tilsonfunds.com slash tilsoncalamities.pdf, capital T in Tilson, uh, tilsoncalamities.pdf. 
Uh, so number one is, is she, and I alternate the genders from question. These are the exact same questions male and females would ask of each other uh, or in, if they're marrying someone of the same gender, et cetera. So I just alternate uh, gender pronouns in these questions. So is she a kind and good-hearted person, both toward you and others? Does she have a mean bone in her body? How does she treat people beneath her, like employees or waiters? Do children and dogs like her? All going to someone, do they just have a good heart? Number two, if you weren't romantically uh, interested in each other, would you be close friends? Do you make each other better? Right, so there's a whole, uh, there's nothing in here I think that's you know earth shattering to anybody, but I think it really helps to write down these questions and to go through the checklist. Um, you know, just as when you're an investor, having a checklist um, to make sure you don't miss anything, um, you know, and not everything here is, is equally weighted. Um, there are more important things than others and nobody scores a hundred percent. Um, but, uh, but you know, there are some things in here that you, you know, you probably shouldn't compromise on at all. Um, and the last question is my favorite number 12. Do you think he's hot? Do you have a wild, passionate sex life? Um, and I, I write in here that I've deliberately listed this as the least important question, but sadly and foolishly, many young people seem to put it first. Um, and I have had friends um, who are, have been trapped in miserable marriages uh, for a long period of time. And, you know, they will admit uh, that, you know, they, they, they just thought the other person was really beautiful, sexy, hot. Uh, and uh, they got sucked into being married to a person who's just not very nice, not very interesting, um, because they had a wild, passionate sex life when they were young. Um, and that is a calamity. Uh, so let me quickly just briefly shift to the married folks. Um, and uh, I've been married almost uh, 25 years now. And there's a whole series of questions here that, um, that we can go through. Uh, but basically, assuming you married the right person, um, you know, how do you, um, uh, you know, how do you maintain a marriage that let's say on a scale of one to 10 is at least north of an eight. I would put that at a happy, healthy level. Um, you know, it's probably not gonna be a 10 all the time. Uh, no matter what, uh, but anything that starts to dip below an eight and certainly below a six, um, you know, my observation is, is that certainly among my friends and family that I've observed now more than a dozen divorces up close in the past five years or so, um, it's uh, generally in most cases, they married the right person. They, they were uh, a good couple and they were happy for the first five years. And then the happiness went from an eight in the eight plus in the first five years down to a six in the next five years, and then down to a four and then down to a two and boom, uh, you know, ended in the calamity of divorce, you know, 15, 20, 25 years in. Um, so that is a trend line that you want to be very, very acutely sensitive to and avoid it. So again, we're going to shift back to investing in a moment, but I just wanted to throw that out there um, about, you know, how do you avoid that? Well, one, just being aware of the health of your marriage, uh, talking about it um, and uh, focusing on the big things, but not just the big things, all the little things matter too. Um, so I've got a whole list of uh, big things and then also little things here. Um, that I'm not going to bore you with, uh, but you can read at your, uh, at your leisure um, and some of uh, sort of my observations and experiences. Um, uh, by the way, uh, making a lot of money um, does not uh, actually, in my view, making a lot of money um, actually increases your odds uh, of divorce, not decreases, which is what most people think for the seven reasons I've outlined here. Um, and also, if you're running money um, and uh, you're going through a divorce, um, that is very likely to have a very negative impact uh, on your business and on your investing performance uh, for the variety of reasons that I lay out here. Um, and one of the warning flags uh, for those of you who are reaching middle age like me is when your youngest child reaches adolescence um, is, has really been a trigger for uh, a lot of people I know getting divorced. Uh, again, for a variety of reasons uh, outlined here. So. Um, uh, so those are, uh, those are some thoughts I just wanted to share digressing. Um, I'm writing this new book right now and I'm pretty excited about it. And, um, and, um, um, uh, when it's out, I, I hope you'll uh, buy a copy, uh, but mostly I'm writing it for my own three daughters. Uh, I, I want to try and sort of help them. My oldest daughter, uh, graduated from college two days ago, Carleton college out in Minnesota. We just came in yesterday. Uh, flew back and, uh, you know, she's um, going to be working at Ernst & Young uh, here back here in New York in the fall. She's just starting her work career. She's had a boyfriend now, a serious boyfriend for three years. So, 
you know, there's that, the stuff I'm teaching on marriage is, um, you know, if, if only three people read my book, my three daughters, and it has any little impact on them, uh, I will consider it time well spent. Um, but I'm sort of writing it and, and publishing in a book in the hopes that it might benefit other people as well. So let me uh, now shift back, uh, Glenn, uh, you know, hit me with the next uh, investing related question. Many thanks for your informative session. Now that we've gotten this, what, why would we come to one of the seminars? <laughs> um, well, we have been going now for two hours and 10 minutes. Um, our three day boot camp is uh, three days, 12 hour days. Um, um, and so we have just barely scratched the surface in the last two hours, uh, not even close to 10% of what we teach in the boot camp. Um, if you're considering, ever considering uh, starting your own fund, uh, the one day seminar on how to launch an investment uh, fund. Uh, and then the, the one day seminar on short selling. Again, we have not talked at all about short selling here, which is I think a key uh, uh, tool in the toolbox as well. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, um, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm delighted if, uh, if you've learned something here and gotten something out of it, but what, uh, uh, again, don't ask a barber if you need a haircut, but my view, if, if our roles were reversed, and I saw a couple pretty smart, experienced guys uh, um, who've experienced incredible success, but also some big setbacks and made some big mistakes, both as investors and as entrepreneurs. And I was interested in that business, uh, either as an avid amateur or certainly if I was a professional, um, I would uh, move heaven and earth um, to go spend more time with those people um, and learn from them. So. That's why I go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting and schlep out to Omaha for a weekend every uh, first weekend of May for the last 21 years. Uh, I've gone out there to sit at the feet of Buffett and Munger, and I don't claim Glenn and I are Buffett and Munger, but then again, Buffett and Munger aren't running a private seminar for you either. Um, you know, Glenn and I have enormous experience in what I would give to go back in time and be able to teach myself. I mean, I would literally pay millions of dollars to go back and spend one hour with myself 20 years ago. Um, and just in one hour, if I could just hit some of the highlights and warn my younger self about some of the mistakes, uh, some of the big mistakes I made and how to avoid those. Um, I, you know, I'm not talking about you know, giving myself stock tips. I'm just talking about, um, you know, some, you know, don't just be dogmatic about valuation, um, you know, be willing to pay up for some incredible businesses that you identify, um, you know, when you do hit it for the first 12 years, uh, really go out and make a lot of hay and raise a lot of money and, and build a real business. Don't be, don't be a stupid cheapskate like I was, um, you know, some of those, some of those lessons, um, uh, were multi, multi-million dollar, probably tens of millions of dollar mistakes um, that I just didn't know better. Um, I didn't spend five or 10 years apprenticing with someone. And so if you haven't either, uh, but you're out there investing material amounts of money, and certainly if you're in this business professionally, um, I'm convinced to my knowledge, and I've been in this business now for almost 20 years, there is nobody in the world teaching what we're teaching. Uh, right now. Um, and the only way you can learn what we're teaching is, is if you, you get a job at a big hedge fund and, you know, someone like Julian Robertson or, you know, John Griffin, uh, you know, that Bill Ackman, that kind of person trains you. But the number of jobs uh, with those kind of people um, are just so few and far between. 99 plus percent of investors simply don't have that option available them, to them to learn. So where else are you supposed to learn? Well, the answer is, is you can go out and try and bootstrap it. That's what I did, but there were big gaps in my knowledge and I paid a huge price as a result of that. Um, Glenn and I have tried to capture in a very, very condensed, like drinking from a fire hose format, and teaching all the biggest lessons we've learned and we pack it into, uh, you know, roughly a full 40 hours of teaching over five days. Um, and so, you know, we're for free, giving away a couple hours of it here. Um, but I think anyone with any common sense, honestly, um, is going to come back and want uh, 10 to 20 times more than that uh, at one of our programs. How do you use the Kelly rule for sizing positions? <laughs> 
Yeah, there's something called the Kelly rule or the Kelly formula, which is um, where you, it's sort of a mathematical equation that tells you how big to size a position. And the concept behind it is sound, which is that if you plug in that a stock has 5% downside and 50% upside, uh, then you should make that a big position. Um, and the, the smaller your downside and the bigger your upside, the bigger you should make your position. The problem with the Kelly formula is, is that most people who use the formula um, plug in a number north of zero for the downside. And that's where the Kelly formula, uh, if you do that, the Kelly formula spits out a bogus number, um, which is every stock has a possible downside of zero, even Berkshire Hathaway. But Warren Buffett himself said in, in late 2008, had the US government not come in and bailed out the entire financial system, Berkshire Hathaway itself would have gone under. Um, he said it would have been the last one to go, but we would have gone too. Um, so, uh, uh, so the problem where I've seen the Kelly formula get into trouble is, is there's a stock trading at $24 and somebody plugs in 20 as the maximum possible downside. Um, and of course, mathematically, if it truly is something where the downside is 20, you should not only put 100% of your fund in something, you, you should probably lever it up. Um, if, if, the down, if the upside is 50 and the downside is 20 for a stock trading at 24. But the point is, is there, there is no such stock trading at 24 where the maximum possible downside is 20 bucks. You always have to put in some chance of a zero. And that changes the output uh, from the Kelly formula uh, dramatically. So my sense is, is don't use it. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, don't bother studying it. Um, the general concept is a simple and obvious one. Um, that you should size your higher conviction ideas better, uh, bigger, and that things that have a lot less downside that are particularly safe with strong balance sheets, things like Berkshire Hathaway, you, uh, it's okay to size Berkshire Hathaway north of 10%. Uh, something that's a little bit more of a speculation, like my biggest winner last year was Hertz. I bought it down from 50 to 10, um, and within six weeks, it was north of 20. Um, I bought it on a bounce, but I only bought a two and a half percent position because that was the proper sizing for something that had a lot of debt um, and a business that has still has huge issues. And that stock could have gone to zero in short order. I caught it on a bounce. Um, same thing with a couple of stocks we've talked about here, also like Valiant to Platform Holdings. It's okay to take a little bit of a flyer on something riskier, but you better not be using the Kelly formula and looking at platform at, I don't know, $13 today and saying, oh, I don't think it's going to go below 10 and plugging in 10 is your downside on platform. Your downside on platform, especially a company, a levered roll up like that, there's there, you, you better plug in a material chance of a zero for something like that. And that's okay. There was a material chance of a zero on Hertz when I bought it a year ago, um, but I sized it appropriately and I correctly anticipated that the uh, negativity was overdone. Um, are there any fund managers who did well in the olden days who are still doing well? Who are they? What are their names? Well, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, it's just incredible at age 87 and 94, how they're still learning, still on a steep learning curve, and they haven't fallen into any of the traps about trying to have a macro view and getting into the shorting and, and other things that, that hurt me. Um, you know, they, they never have gotten too smart for their own britches. Um, and the fact that Buffett was looking at a $3 billion investment just the other day in Uber, he, he, he was only willing to do it on his terms. Um, but the fact that he was even willing to look at Uber for a guy who's never really done tech, who's uh, 87 years old, is, is just remarkable. And everyone should try and emulate that, uh, those Buffett and Munger, both as investors, but also, as I commented earlier, and in the book I'm writing, as 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 uh, just admirable human beings who live their life the right way. And uh, I've, they have made such a big difference in, in my life outside of investing. I'm really writing this book partly for my daughters, but partly as a tribute to them, as a thank you to them, and trying to spread their gospel, because I'm a believer, um, not just their investing gospel, their life gospel. Um, so I would put Seth Klarman up there. He continues to do well at Baupost Group, one of the legends out there. Um, you know, Julian Robertson is still doing well. Um, so I don't know, Glenn, who else among sort of the big name uh, folks? Uh, you know, some hedge funds out there are still doing well. Larry Robbins is crushing it at Glenview. And, um, there, there's a lot of names that come to mind, and I don't think it's, it's right to single them out. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, third, you know, I follow 13F, uh, 13F filings of yeah. a lot of the big investors. 
Um, you know, some of the spin-offs out of uh, Pershing Square, um, Mick McGuire Mercado, Scott Ferguson, Paul Hillal, uh, who's really done a one-stock uh, fund so far with Mantle Ridge. Um, you know, so, so um, they're, um, you know, those are some of the names of, uh, of the people that are still, still doing well. Here's a great question. Um, and it has to do with timing in, in, in the market. With the national debt surpassing 20 trillion, no end in sight, is another financial calamity worse than 2008 coming? Thoughts if and when it, uh, if and when the stock market could drop 25 to 50 percent, and what could trigger it? Yeah. Um, um, if I thought that there was a ma there were a major correction coming, I would not have closed my fund last fall. Um, it was the frustration of feeling like I had to ab abandon my value investing principles to try and keep up with this market, but also um, feeling like I didn't see anything that was going to change anytime soon. Um, and uh, so because I, I do not see the kind of wild ridiculousness across the markets like I saw in the internet bubble. Um, I, the closest thing to it is the foolishness around Bitcoin um, and the cryptocurrencies, which is just an obvious fad and bubble. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin's down by two thirds um, and it's going down by 90% from, i.e., $2,000 a share, in my opinion, certainly to $4,000 a share. Um, uh, I think. Uh, but Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies collectively, um, you know, are just relatively small relative to the total economy, relative to the big bubbles we saw in the internet craze um, and in the housing uh, bubble debt financial uh, craze in 2007. Uh, so, so that's the dilemma. Um, um, I, you know, if you ask me, do I think, uh, what are the odds that there's a stock market correction of at least 25% in the next 12 months? Uh, I would say less than 20%. Um, uh, so the question now is, is okay, uh, but, uh, but in the next five years, I'd say 80%, you know, that we get at least one 20% correction, probably more than one. Um, um, and part of that, by the way, is, is look, um, um, Donald Trump inherited an economy with a lot of momentum, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And he and the Republicans, via deregulation and tax cuts, have poured kerosene onto that fire. And so um, they're doing everything they can, pulling every lever to juice economic growth and all. But the question is, is you can always pour uh, uh, stimulus, uh, pour kerosene on that fire by slashing taxes and letting debt go through the roof. That's the trade-off. And I find it sort of ironic that, um, uh, that it's been Republicans uh, that have been, uh, that were crying about uh, and expressing grave, grave concern about rising debt levels. Um, and, uh, and now when they came into power, um, they just passed a budget buster, um, which has the short term effect of juicing, uh, economic growth and juicing the stock market. But if you look at Donald Trump's history, uh, as a business person, he's been a boom and bust kind of guy. And so, um, over the next year, I think the kerosene still keeps that fire really cooking. Um, but at some point, um, uh, I think this starts to run out of gas, um, and it's like a, a runner that has sprinted for 100 yards after running a marathon, um, and then sprints, uh, they sort of run out of gas. That's certainly what's happened in Donald Trump's business career. So if you ask me to predict, you know, just sort of a general recession, et cetera, it could come as the, as the negative after effects, the hangover effect from all these uh, big stimulative measures going on. So that would be sort of US economic um, related. Also, um, valuations are now sort of at the 90th percentile historically. So not the kind of bubble territory where I would predict a big downturn uh, coming, uh, but certainly getting up there where, where there's, uh, there's more downside. And then sort of geopolitically, um, you know, who knows what happens with North Korea and where and where these talks end up. Like if you were to tell me that the market was down 30 uh, percent in the near future or let's say in the next year, what could cause it? Um, you know, sort of the third guess uh, I would have, uh, having already outlined two, um, would be uh, would be uh, something geopolitical um, uh, related to the Middle East and or North Korea. Obviously, if there were ever any use of nuclear weapons anywhere in the world by a terrorist uh, 
or on the Korean Peninsula, um, uh, all bets are off. Uh, you know, heaven forbid that ever happens. Um, but uh, also, I would throw in the odds of a trade war among the world's wealthiest uh, blocks, uh, uh, obviously between the U.S. and the European Union, and with China and with Japan. Um, which you know collectively is probably three fourths of the world's GDP. Um, the odds of a trade war um, have gone up materially just in the past uh, week, I would argue. Um, so actually, I might throw that back uh, almost on the top of the list of, um, of you know these escalating tit for tat tariffs um, that could uh, really disrupt global supply chains. Um, so so um, you know, but again, let me be clear, these are all things I sort of worry about. I'm a value investor, we worry, uh, but none of these things do I think are particularly imminent. Um, so uh, so I think you know it's interesting. these bull market geniuses have just sort of been piling in to the hot stocks and so, so forth. Uh, they're going to get clobbered on Bitcoin, but I think you know uh, just generally in the market, um, you know, my guess is, is my default most likely, single most likely option is, is that things continue to plug along. Let's see. Um, a lot of people don't like Bill Agnew. You seem to have a good relationship with him. Could you talk about the qualities that you like in him? What makes him a good analyst? Yeah. Um, uh, Bill and I uh, go back to... Um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, we met uh, selling advertising in the Let's Go Travel Guides after my freshman year and his sophomore year at Harvard. Um, and interestingly, I didn't like him the first time I met him either. Uh, he was sort of full of himself and he's very competitive. And, uh, you know, I can certainly see, I experienced it myself on how he sort of rubbed me the wrong way initially. But as I got to know him, um, he is a truly great guy, um, has a heart of gold, extremely um, generous, uh, caring person. Um, no, there's never been a more loyal friend. Um, very high integrity. Uh, he, t he shoots straight. Um, he sometimes gets into trouble for shooting too straight. Um, there are very, very, very few people who by the age of 50 have given away $400 million philanthropically. Um, so, you know, I, he's not just a generous person, um, but um, uh, but also uh, an incredibly philanthropic person, um, and he's enormous fun, uh, enormously fun to be around. Uh, you know, he's just has a zest for life, loves doing fun things, um, and uh, as even the people who don't like him would probably admit, yeah, it's probably he's probably a fun guy to hang out with. Uh, you know, likes to do fun things, uh, always entertaining, uh, et cetera. So. Um, so Bill's one of my, uh, became one of my closest friends very rapidly after our initially rocky few weeks um, and uh, has remained one of my closest friends ever since. We both raised three daughters together of roughly the same age. Uh, so we're very close personally and professionally. I probably learned uh, second only to Buffett and Munger. I probably learned more about investing from Bill, from spending time with him, uh, from reading his investor letters. Uh, I've made a lot of money following him into uh, some of his great investments uh, historically. Um, and uh, so I, I owe him a debt of gratitude uh, as, a, as a mentor and a teacher. Um, and he's been very generous in giving, in teaching investing to the next generation, meeting with students, um, uh, you know, speaking and teaching publicly at, uh, you know, Columbia Business School classes and conferences, that kind of thing. Uh, so to those of you uh, who don't like Bill, uh, I would argue that none of you knows him even 1% as well as I do. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you that you just don't know. Um, and if you did and you spent more time with him, uh, you'd come to realize, yeah, he's got a big ego. Mostly he backs it up. Um, but he's got a really good heart and is a great guy. And if you got to know him, you'd really like him just like I do. Um, how do you evaluate management when you uh, are not a multi-billion dollar investor? Yeah, it's a good question. It gets back to uh, the three steps to evaluating stocks uh, before you get to valuation. And number three is evaluating management. And someone uh, chatted in a good question, um, which is, well, how am I as an individual investor or how did you guys as you know small hedge fund, uh, how did you evaluate management? Um, and the answer is, is um, it wasn't what you might think, which is, oh, we went and spent a lot of time with them personally. No. Um, uh, in fact, you have to be super careful meeting these people personally 
I'm not saying don't do it, and sometimes it can be very valuable, but it can also be a trap. Um, because the people who get to be CEOs of companies generally have high charisma. A lot of them do, and it's very easy to get fooled. Um, and the, here's the thing, you know, there's a certain fraction of them that are just complete pathological liars, but much more dangerous are the ones who are telling you something that isn't true, i.e. the future of my company is brilliant, but they genuinely believe it. And they're generally the last people to know that their business is falling apart. And so it's very easy to get fooled by a super confident, charismatic CEO who's telling you, oh, you know, that we just missed a quarter. It's no big deal. We're coming right back. Here, here's our brilliant plan to fix things. Um, yet it's uh, Bed Bath & Beyond or some, you know, dying, uh, dying business. Um, and you get sucked into a value trap because uh, you've gotten to personally know the management team. Um, I can tell you in something like Spark Networks, this tiny little company that owned JDate, uh, the dating site, um, you know, Glenn and I got sucked into a value trap in, in part because we knew the activist who was on the board, we knew the management, um, and it turns out we got too close, and we sort of thought that gave us an edge, and in fact, that blinded us to the reality that Tinder was destroying the business. Um, uh, so uh, so how, do you, how should you evaluate management? Look at their track record. Don't look at what they say. Don't listen to what they say. Look at what they've done. So don't listen to all their fancy talk about great capital allocation. Go back and look at what their capital allocation has been over time. Uh, uh, you know, don't, don't listen to them say, oh, don't worry about uh, the business. That was just one quarter. Go look at the company's track record. And if a company like Coke has had revenues and operating income decline steadily for five consecutive years, um, the idea that investors should believe that, oh, Coke's now going to turn things around and it's going to go back to being a growth company. Uh, I, I think you should not listen to management. You should instead look at the business and look at the numbers. Uh, where I find we and other investors get into trouble is when they take their eye uh, off the numbers um, and off the track record um, and uh, fall in love with the people um, and with the story. Um, are we going to make the presentation available um, and or the video? Yes, um, this, uh, this entire PowerPoint presentation uh, and as well as uh, the video um, we will uh, send uh, to everyone who uh, registered for this seminar. We'll get a personal email with the video, uh, the link to the video embedded um, as well as the uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, and then we'll post it on our social media. Uh, so sign up uh, for our Facebook, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn accounts uh, for case learning, um, where you can, uh, and, and by the way, you can also, if you shoot me an email or just reply to the email I sent around, um, I have an investing email list with 6,000 or so people on it uh, over the years, um, to whom I send uh, one or two emails a week with a collection of generally four to six or seven uh, articles and things uh, of interest. Um, so for example, video, even for the people who didn't sign up for this webinar, um, we, uh, I will send out uh, these slides and a link to the video of it to all 6,000 people, for example, on that email list um, in case uh, they want to they watch it or, um, or uh, read the PowerPoint. What are your thoughts about um, magic formula uh, investing and computerized magic formula? Yeah, so uh, Magic Formula is something uh, my friend Joel Greenblatt, I think, uh, developed and wrote about it in his book, The Little Book That Beats, Beats the Market, originally. And the Magic Formula is basically a quantitative formula that uh, screens for companies uh, that trade at, a, is it low book or low PE multiple? Um, on magic, on my, it's low um, it's, uh, it's, e EBIT divided by enterprise value. Okay, so enterprise value divided by EBIT, which is just a measure of multiple of cash flow. Um, and then the other metric is high return on equity. So if you think about it, what is the, the general two things that any sensible investor would want to look for is companies that generate very high returns on capital that are trading at low multiples. Those are the, you know, buying good companies at a low valuation. Good companies, cheap is generally speaking what you want to do. So Joel uh, has quantified this 
written a book about it, and then he has applied it, um, has uh, interestingly, for a special situations value guy who compounded at something like 50% a year for 15 years before retiring from that. He, and, and he sometimes you know, would put virtually all of his capital into one stock. Uh, he was a super concentrated, very volatile, but very good special situation investor. And one of the pioneering books um, uh, in this space it was his original book um, called uh, you, you, can be a, you Can Be a Stock Market Genius. Sorry, I had a, a senior moment there. Um, and uh, so I highly recommend that to learn about special situation uh, investing. Uh, but it's sort of ironic that one of the great, you know, bottoms up stock picker, fundamental uh, special situations value investors uh, for the past, I don't know, at least 10 years or so uh, has, um, uh, has now pivoted and is a quant investor, um, albeit a very different kind of quant investor from, you know, Renaissance slash medallion or two sigma, much more simple formula. And he's got a bunch of different products uh, along, only along short, uh, I think one with a little bit of leverage. Um, but uh, as best I understand it, uh, the track record is excellent. Joel is one of the smartest, most high-grade people uh, I know, a good personal friend. Um, so, uh, you know, among, quote, active managers, uh, non-indexers that are out there trying to beat the market and trying to control risk and protect your downside, um, he'd be very close to the top of my list. Um, is it smart to consider stocks outside of the United States, like Korean stocks, which Buffett invested in, um, or is it best to just stay in North America? Um, the answer is, is it depends. Um, I, he, I hate to keep giving that answer, um, but whether you should invest outside the United States, to some extent, depends on whether that is part of your circle of competence, and that's something that can be developed over time. As I said uh, early, early during the initial slides, to the extent that you live in a foreign country, you are from a, another country, you speak the language, um, you, you know people there, you have networks there, um, I would strongly suggest uh, developing that and developing expertise outside of the United States because the United States is the largest and most efficient and picked over stock market in the world. You're just much more likely to find mispriced situations um, uh, in other countries, and the smaller and more obscure, the better. Um, so look, I, uh, I think in the major developed markets, uh, you know, many of the European exchanges, uh, probably Japan, uh, I would put that in Canada, I would put that in one category. Then you have sort of tier two markets where they're, I would consider them, uh, uh, you know, investable, but certainly riskier, and you probably want to have some expertise there. I put Brazil, Korea, um, another step down from there would probably be India, which is a little bit more of the Wild West. Then a big step down from there would be China, and then a big step down from there would be Russia, for example, um, which I view as completely uninvestable at any price. Um, uh, just because it's a controlled market, it's an oligopoly. Um, and uh, I've heard of too many stories, for example, in China and India um, of outside investors uh, getting their faces ripped off, frankly, um, because uh, they're not insiders um, and it's the, there isn't the same uh, regulatory protections. There just isn't the culture of passive minority shareholders being treated fairly in uh, a lot of these countries. But um, oh, at one time I did own some Hyundai preferred. I own some Samsung preferred. I think Korean preferreds are a fascinating asset class. Um, probably one of the cheapest asset classes in the world. But you know, you're not going to generally probably lose a lot of money. I didn't, but I didn't make a lot of money either. They sort of have been cheap and and they've been cheap for a long, long time. And it's not clear to me that there's any major catalyst. Um, so they were the, the better form of value trap in that I didn't lose any money, but I didn't make much money either. I think another consideration has to do with um, local uh, um, securities laws, um, securities practices. Um, and as an example, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Alibaba, uh, which is here, a fantastic. Come, come, come on stage. Here, here. Ali, Alibaba is a fantastic company, and it's a um, it's a, uh, a cheaper company than the counterparts uh, in the United States. Um, but there's a corporate governance um, question, which is, what do you own when you own a share of Alibaba? Um, and when uh, all is going well, you don't have to worry about questions like that. 
but what are your uh, legal um, uh, options when things aren't going well? Um, can assets be seized from you? That's not a question uh, that should be completely ignored, and sh you should think about th things like that in your ultimate valuation uh, um, uh, calculus. Um, and as Whitney kind of des described early on, when everything's going well, people don't worry about those sorts of issues. And I, I do sense that there is almost no fear in the markets today that, um, that rapid fire declines uh, could ever happen again. Um, and they can and they will. Um, and we've been through um, a number of them and they feel really, really bad. And often you don't, uh, you don't see them coming. Uh, one of the questions that Whitney was asked earlier um, had to do with what could uh, cause the next decline. Um, and, and my answer to that would be, uh, would be actually related to interest rates. Interest rates are gravity. Um, all valuation, uh, all, all value investing valuation has to do with the cash that the company can generate. And that cash being discounted at a greater discount rate um, definitionally makes the intrinsic value decline. Um, so uh, interest rates going from two to three to 4%, maybe that uh, isn't such a big deal, um, but they can go higher. And when they do go higher and the discount rate uh, that you're using makes the terminal value look lower and the cash flows in the future look lower, um, ought to result in uh, stock price uh, stock prices coming down. Um, Whitney, I think we're about done with the questions. Yeah. Um there's one more question I thought was worth addressing here. Um, There's probably more than one, and I apologize if I haven't um, incorporated them all, but I tried. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, um, so um, click the chat button on your screen. If you, um, if you have any burning questions uh, that you haven't had a chance to address, uh, Glenn's uh, checking the chat right now. Um, but there is one that, um, it's sort of a simple question, but it's really a critical one, which is, when do you sell? Um, and um, the, the corollary of that is as to, well, when should you buy something, right? At what point do you sort of make the decision to actually take action, given that generally speaking, the fewer investment decisions that you make, the better off you will be over your career. Um, but um, uh, you can go too far with that. Um, and if you fail to buy something that you probably should buy, that can be very expensive. And if you fail to sell something you should sell, that can be very expensive. Um, so look, generally speaking, it just, you have to have a valuation framework for every single position you own. You need to have some uh, calculation. You obviously shouldn't buy it unless you have calculated some estimate of intrinsic value. So the beauty of this, by the way, is it keeps you out of so much trouble. Um, you know, you would just never buy Bitcoin. Uh, and so you missed it on the way up. So what? You also missed the two thirds decline on the way down. Because Bitcoin, by definition, has no intrinsic value. It generates no cash flow. It never will. You, you can't value it. Um, um, so you're not going to invest in art or coins or gold or anything like that. It really makes your investment life pretty simple. And yeah, you're going to miss out on the run-ups of one thing or another, but who cares? Um, just focus on things where you can calculate. So the first answer to the question, both of when to buy and when to sell, is is well, when you buy something, when thing trade, something trades at a big discount to intrinsic value, um, and very importantly, not, not only is it cheap, but it's safe. In other words, um, you want something where, for example, I remember buying McDonald's uh, back in 2002 and early 2003. Um, the stock had declined from 45 to 16, and I estimated that the real estate at itself was worth $9 a share. And then they had a franchising business that was worth a few dollars a share easily. Forget the company owned restaurant business. Um, and so I figured my downside was pretty well covered. And I figured intrinsic value was well north of $20 a share. I sort of pegged it somewhere in the mid 20s. And that was all I needed to know with the stock at 16. That uh, my downside was well protected. And I thought the upside was at least 50%. Um, and uh, there was a new CEO coming in. Uh, they were developing new products like McGriddles and big salads and white meat chicken McNuggets. Um, um, and the business had just been so poorly managed. Um, and franchisees were in revolts. I thought the new CEO, Jim Cantalupo, could come in and there was lots of low hanging fruit. 
um, that could be catalysts, and everything played out magnificently. But here's the thing. The stock went from 16 to 12 the first three months I owned it because the near-term things that were weighing on the stocks, namely negative same-store sales, continued uh, when I bought the stock had been negative for 20 or 21 consecutive months of negative same store sales. And that continued for another three months after I bought it. And so the stock just went down. It went down almost 25% where I bought it. But because I had a real sound valuation framework, uh, I knew I had good downside protection. Um, my upside hadn't changed. It just became more attractive at 12 than it was at 16. So I took a 5% position that had declined to a 4% position, and I, and I more than doubled it up to a 10% position. And I rode that stock from 12 to $65 a share over the next five years. It was one of the great wins of my early investing career. So then this is an interesting case study, though. Well, when do you sell it? And the answer is, is when it gets, you probably should start selling it as it gets to the low end of your calculation of the range of intrinsic value. Um, and, uh, and then you probably want to continue selling it as it moves up through the range of intrinsic value. But there are a couple key caveats to that. Number one, um, if, the, if the stock is moving up, it's probably because the business is doing well. It's exceeding expectations. The turnaround is, is kicking in. Jim Canlupo is turning out to be a great CEO of McDonald's, etc. right? So the key is, is with McDonald's, and this is the real dream of what you should look for, is that the stock continues, uh, your, as the stock moves up, you have to constantly be updating and increasing your estimate of intrinsic value to reflect all the good things that are happening. So by the time McDonald's reached $25 a share about a year later, you'd think, oh, well, that was my estimate of intrinsic value. Why didn't I sell it then? And the answer is, is because the turnaround was kicking in uh, in a beautiful and wonderful way. The upside scenario was playing out beautifully. And so by the time it got to 25, I pegged intrinsic value at 35. And then about a year later, it reached $35 a share. But here's where it gets interesting. Bill Ackman came in and an activist got involved and, and he laid out plans to uh, spin off their uh, wholly owned uh, 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 restaurant business and keep the real estate in the franchising business. And it turned out the company didn't do that, but uh, Bill persuaded them to change some of their reporting and helped uh, the market come to appreciate that McDonald's really had two spectacular businesses buried in a restaurant operating business, which is a much less spectacular business. The two spectacular businesses being owning real estate and charging uh, rent on the real estate, and then also charge, uh, being a franchisor and uh, um, just getting a, a, a revenue uh, franchise fee stream. Uh, so by the time I was thinking about selling at 35, Bill Ackman made a pretty compelling case that the stock was worth 65. So, I, so after uh, nearly tripling my money, more doubling from my initial cost, tripling from uh, where I really loaded up at the lows, um, I was probably thinking about selling by the time it reached 35. Um, and Bill Ackman came in and was a catalyst and I got another double out of it. So I ended up making a lot more money for that reason. Now, interestingly, the stock really didn't do much. It was one of only two stocks in the Dow of the 30 stocks in the Dow that was up in 2008. The other one was Walmart. Um, but during 2008, so McDonald's stock was holding up pretty well. I had a good sized position. So I ended up selling the McDonald's to buy much, much, much cheaper stocks that had really gotten massacred. Um, in the downturn. So, you know, the answer in, again, everything we teach is really in the form of case studies. So this is an interesting case study of both buying well um, and in selling actually re reasonably well, hanging on for a ride. And that's the last thing I'll leave you with, which is I've owned a couple real rocket ships in my career. Um, I owned SodaStream from 36 down to 12, and the stock's almost at 100 today, um, just in the last few years. Um, I own Netflix. Um, I was short it um, mistakenly, but then got out. And when the stock really got clobbered in the whole Quickster debacle, I got in and in fact owned uh, almost a 4% position, a 50 bagger ago when the stock bottomed um, at $53 a share. There's been a seven for one split since then. So the stock was at 777 a share. Um, and that was almost a 50 bagger ago. And here's where I made a mistake on selling, which is, and here's a lesson I'll give you. And I made the same mistake though, to a lesser degree on SodaStream, at least I have a little bit of a, of a learning curve here, which is if you really do hit, hit a stock, um, one of those once every five or 10 year stocks 
where the company is turning around um, and it's just crushing it. And Netflix, for example, has not had a single quarter of revenue growth less than 25 or I think even 30% in the last five or six years. Um, you know, a company that is growing at that rate, um, that stock is going up. I don't care what the valuation is, is if a company is growing its revenues uh, at 20, 25, or especially north of 30% or something like Facebook, at 50% a year, quarter in and quarter out, you want to be trimming the position if you're lucky enough to own one of those stocks. But my suggestion is, is let that thing run. Um, that doesn't mean let it run up to a 20 or 30% position. Obviously, if I owned a 4% position at Netflix at 50 bagger ago, if I had just let that position run, um, you know, I, I'd be a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, decimillionaire, if not centimillionaire today, for sure. But I, I don't have any regrets at trimming a risky, volatile stock um, when it runs up, it becomes a big position in your portfolio. But where I was foolish was is, is that I sold it out entirely. And basically the right way to have played Netflix is, is as the story played out, as the company every single quarter was just crushing it and just putting up incredible numbers, you know, I should have let that position run up to a five or six percent position um, as the company just continued to execute. And then every time it ran up to 10 percent or something, I should have trimmed I, I should have trimmed it back to to five or six percent and just kept doing it. And that would have been the right way to play it. And instead, I was just too conservative. Um, you know, I you know, it was getting harder to justify the valuation. And this is actually a case study we teach in great depth. Um, in our in our uh, investing boot camp this week, because we can we can show you the the um, enterprise value for, per subscriber valuation, and in fact on that metric, which is actually a pretty good metric for valuing Netflix, um, the stock uh, was actually much cheaper than I was giving it credit for, and so basically I owned a three percent position, and every time it went up to a five percent position, I kept trimming it back to three percent, and then after I'd made about five times my money, um, I sold out entirely. And uh, shame on me. Um, that was, you know, it's hard to say shame on me when I made five times my money and I completely nailed it. But, um, you know, it's, it, it leaves a, a real sick feeling in my stomach, honestly, um, when I hit the stock of the decade and I nailed it. I, I pitched it publicly at my Value Investing Congress conference on October 1st of 2012. I went on national television that afternoon, right after I got off stage. And, I, and it was literally the day Netflix bottomed at 777 a share. And I said, Netflix is this decade's Amazon. And at that time, Amazon over the previous 10 years had been a 20 bagger. And I said, I think Netflix is gonna be at least a 10 bagger in the next decade, maybe more. Um, and I was absolutely right on that. And then via bad portfolio management and just being a chicken shit, honestly, um, I, I, I had a nice victory on something that should have been a grand slam. I hit a, I hit a double and I should have hit four consecutive grand slams. That's the stock that I owned. Um, so my, my, the one, uh, the, 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 the lesson here is, is yes, you have to manage risk, pay attention to valuation and position sizing. But also if a company is just crushing it and they're putting up no, quarter after quarter of great numbers, um, you know, manage the position size uh, appropriately, but let that thing run. And, uh, and don't, don't pick your flowers and water your weeds. That is a disastrous uh, portfolio management uh, strategy. All right. Um, I think uh, we're, we've gone from 150 people down to 58 people. Um, for you diehards, um, I appreciate you staying on for so long. Uh, we're just about uh, approaching three hours. Um, so if uh, we didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, feel free to email us um, uh, uh, and follow up. Um, and um, if you liked uh, what we were teaching here and you think you'd benefit from doing a much, much, much deeper dive uh, over the course of three, four or five days, uh, we're, we're doing it starting tomorrow in New York. Uh, we're doing it in 13 cities around the world starting in London next month. Um, we're going to be doing it in New York as part of that nine-month, 13-city tour. Uh, that doesn't account, uh, include doing it in New York uh, the third week of September um, or the first week of December. Um, but we're increasingly seeing a big international audience uh, for what we're teaching. So we're, we're going to go to 13 cities around the world with big investment communities um, and, uh, and, and teach there as well. So 
If you want to learn more, just go to caselearning.com um, uh, or drop us a line. And um, uh, we'd love to meet you in person uh, at one of our seminars. And by the way, we're also, um, this webinar that we're doing right here is the first one we've ever taught. Um, and I like it. I think it's a great way to reach a lot of people and it's very efficient for the people, for you all. Um, uh, you don't have to, uh, we noticed people signed up for this webinar uh, from places like Hong Kong, uh, people who aren't in New York. Um, and with the webinar technology that's out there, um, you know, we can teach, uh, I would argue, well north of 90% as well as if uh, people were sitting here in the room with us. Um, and when we're teaching our, our actual boot camp and seminars with a smaller group of people, um, at that point, we're not just taking questions via chat. Um, we could pull people up on live video or live audio, and we can tr truly have an interactive discussion in the way that we can't do with you know 100 plus people uh, on a webinar like this. Um, so we're, we're, um, we're going to be doing a webinar uh, at the end of July, and instead of doing a full day as like we teach in person, um, we're instead going to be teaching it from 7.30 to 10 p.m. every night for 12 nights uh, with one day in between. So basically Monday through Saturday uh, and Monday through Saturday um, starting on July 23rd, uh, whatever that Monday is. I think it's July 23rd. Um, and we're just going to do two and a half hours a day and we're going to break and we're going to teach the uh, nine of the first nine of the 12 days, 22 and a half hours of webinar is going to be the boot camp, the same 22 and a half hours we teach in person, but we're not going to have lunch breaks and afternoon breaks and cocktail breaks, etc. It's just all going to be teaching um, spread out uh, two and a half hours a day, probably in this very room doing using this very technology. Um, and then we're gonna add three more days, August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, where we'll teach the one-day seminar on how to launch and build an investment fund. Uh, again, the seven and a half hours that we teach over the course of one day. In person, we're gonna break up and teach over a webinar over three days. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We think the technology is there, and there are an awful lot of people um, who uh, don't wanna travel to New York, don't wanna pay an airfare, don't wanna stay in a hotel, can't take uh, three, four, three or four days off of work. Um, but would instead uh, love to do a live webinar where they can meet the other students in the class, they can interact real time with Glenn and me, just as if we were doing it in person. Um, so we're gonna uh, experiment with that at the end of July um, over uh, uh, 12 days. Um, and then if we get a good response, uh, we'll probably start do, doing that more regularly. It's obviously a lot easier for Glenn and me um, to uh, teach an audience of people from all over the world who are interested in what we're teaching uh, without us having to travel across 12 time zones to do it. Um, so it's a it's a win-win on both sides. And um, so so um, that that's going to be part of the future of this business as well uh, for, for folks who are interested. So. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end uh, this webinar. I uh, want to thank you all for uh, joining us uh, and sticking with us uh, and um, uh, hope to uh, see you again soon. And we may actually start doing uh, uh, these little sort of free one or two hour webinars on a more regular basis um, on, uh, on different topics. Uh, like Glenn, I, I didn't even tell Glenn this, but I think one topic is, is how to get a job at a hedge fund. Um, I get more emails about that topic than probably anything else, uh, and I have been over the last 20 years. Um, so, you know, putting together a little webinar uh, on that um, uh, I think would be a lot of fun. And, uh, and so, uh, so keep your eye on your email list and on our um, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter accounts for case learning. Um, and uh, we'll let you know when we schedule another one of these. Uh, so with that, uh, Whitney and Glenn signing out. Take care.